Right. Order, order. And can I welcome our first witness to this session in Edinburgh of the Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee of the House of Commons from Westminster. Uh, and we are looking at uh, the relationships within the United Kingdom between uh, the four parliaments, if they're all sitting, and the four uh, governments, uh, if they're all constituted, and in particular at the EU withdrawal bill and the issues arising from the UK's uh, leaving the European Union. And I wonder if you could, first of all, introduce yourself for the record, please. My name is Michael Keating. I am Professor of Politics at the University of Aberdeen and Director of the Centre on Constitutional Change. And I should, um, uh, should say that we had hoped that uh, another witness would be sitting with you. Uh, unfortunately, she's been uh, detained by a family matter. And um, so we'll have to ask you the questions we'd have put, you, put to her in, mm -hmm. as well and we'll try and make it clear what we're asking. Um, uh, to start with, um, can I ask that um, Professor McCarg argued that while the UK is formally a unitary state, there's always been aspects of diversity within the UK constitution. Um, and she uses a phrase, unity and diversity in the constitution. Uh, slightly unfair to ask you what she meant, um, mm -hmm. But um, perhaps you have a view on that. Uh, yes, I, I do. I'm, I'm a political scientist. Uh, Aileen McCarg is, is a lawyer. Uh, but I think we probably have a similar view on this, that there's an ambiguity in the UK Constitution, which goes way back at least to the Treaty of Union between England and Scotland forming the United Kingdom, as to whether this is a unitary state in which the principle of parliamentary sovereignty really is the be-all and end-all of the Constitution, or whether it is a union uh, in which sovereignty is shared, in which there are historic understandings amongst the nations uh, as to the nature of, of the Constitution itself. And uh, that has even been uh, raised in a famous case in the Court of Session here back in 1953, McCormick versus the Lord Advocate. But it was something that didn't really have any resonance in politics until devolution when the multinational nature of the United Kingdom was given an institutional expression uh, and referendums were held in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland to back up plans for devolution they passed and therefore there is a view that that has changed our understanding of the constitution that is a, is a union uh, of diversity that there are there's a division of power and that we must rethink what we mean by Westminster sovereignty. Uh, now, that's one way of thinking about the Constitution. The other way of thinking about the Constitution, which is actually in the Devolution Acts, is that Westminster is still supreme. There's, there's a difference of opinion. Uh, and because most of our Constitution doesn't hinge upon black-letter law, it hinges upon conventions, the question is there, what conventions uh, do we have? Uh, now, because there are those very different views of the Constitution, <clears throat> there's been a practice in the last 20 years to try and not confront that issue where possible. Uh, the Sewell Convention is a way of doing that. Let's respect the devolved powers as far as possible. Uh, let's not take things to the Supreme Court. The UK government has never gone to the Supreme Court over a Scottish Act. It's done so once or twice in, in, in Wales. So let those conventions develop and, and, and grow. And if there are different understandings of the Constitution in different parts of the United Kingdom, we can live with those uh, and, and just get around them politically. Now, Brexit makes that more difficult because Brexit is a shock to the Constitution and certain things have to be written down which were not written down in the past. And that is how we've got to the situation we are in this week, where there is still a dispute between the Scottish and UK governments about this question of really where ultimate authority lies or should lie. Well, that was a tremendous answer. I don't feel I need to ask anything else. And if anybody else wants to ask a supplementary on that, I think we'll move straight on. And to... Oh, sorry, who? Oh, right. Uh, okay. oh, yes, I ought to just bring in the question on, of Northern Ireland, because that presents particular challenges. Um, and perhaps of minor interest uh, to most people, uh, of course, whereas in the island of Great Britain, we have a single civil service. Ireland has a separate civil service for historical reasons. So 
And of course, the history of Ireland and of Northern Ireland presents particular challenges um, uh, of diversity. So how can they be accommodated within the UK constitution outside the EU in the same way as you describe for the rest of the United Kingdom? Well, the same problem arises there because we have a peace agreement in Northern Ireland and a power sharing form of government <coughs> that rests upon quite a bit of suspension of disbelief and different sides buy into it for different reasons. So uh, that nationalists have accepted the border in Northern Ireland and, and the unionists have accepted an Irish dimension. <coughs> they may interpret that rather differently, but they both put aside their long-term aims in favor of uh, an, an agreement because they realize that neither side has won that particular uh, argument. Now the <coughs> Good Friday Agreement and, and the European single market are, are two separate things, but, but they've complemented each other in many ways because with the European single market, it's been possible to give some substance to the Good Friday Agreement, notably by opening up the border. The border exists, the border is recognized, the border has not gone away, but it's been transformed and opened up. Uh, and then it's allowed all island institutions to develop without challenging the notion of British sovereignty, an all-island electricity market, all-island agricultural markets, uh, development of close economic links between uh, the North uh, and the South. So they, 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 they've been complementary, and, and that's given rise to two interpretations of what happens after Brexit, and the, the UK government has tended to take a rather narrow view that whatever does must preserve the Good Friday Agreement as written, whereas the Irish government has taken a more extensive interpretation to say the Brexit agreement must preserve everything that has developed in the 20 years since the Good Friday Agreement. So the implications are, 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 are disputed. Um, I think everybody agrees that we don't want any infrastructure at the border in Northern Ireland. Um, given that uh, the former president of the World Customs Organization, uh, the head of the HMRC, uh, the head of uh, the Irish Revenue, uh, uh, Neil Cody, uh, have all said uh, a frictionless border without infrastructure is possible. Uh, what do you make of the insistence on the the new Republican government in, uh, in, in the Republic of Ireland, which has got a different policy from Enda Kenny's government, and the European Union insisting that there has to be infrastructure at the border if we have regulatory divergence uh, from, uh, from the rest of the EU? Well, I don't think the issue is the physical border. The issue is the existence of a border, whether it's physical or not. Uh, and if you use technology to avoid a physical wall at the border, if you still got regulatory divergence, it's a border. Uh, that provides, uh, that uh, obstructs trade, it creates complications for the single agricultural market, the single uh, energy market. Uh, it will require uh, ways to manage that border. The fact that they are controlled electronically uh, or on the ground is really a secondary issue. Those are different ways of managing the border. Um, um, but, but they're not ways of eliminating the border. Well, all the, all the transactions of goods across the border are, have to be registered electronically anyway through the Intrastat system, the European Intrastat system, um, so that any transaction across a border between a member state within the European Union has to be recorded on a system and logged, and there are different rates of VAT that have to be dealt with, uh, and uh, there is obviously a, an excise duty border, uh, there is um, uh, livestock movements already have to be checked across the border. They can't, you can't move livestock across the Northern Ireland border without being subject to checks. So this isn't a, a Rubicon we're crossing here. It's a, it's a, it's a, no, this is, why, this is why I say that the, the physical border is not actually the issue. Because I think the physical border is the issue. But if you have different regulatory systems, different standards for animal health or uh, agricultural products and so on, then that becomes uh, uh, an obstacle. Well, uh, we, we even already, if you get rid of the physical border, we already have different regulatory standards for animal health, for example. We have higher regulatory standards in the Republic of Ireland. So, I'm just wondering. Well, I mean, have, if, we, have, if we can, if we can resolve this, 
without physical infrastructure at the border, surely that would be sufficient. Yeah, but well, you have mutual recognition in most regulatory systems. Mutual and, recognition. And, and, and so that, 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 that and therefore... Uh, being different from, from regulatory alignment. There's been a lot of mm. uh, <laughs> exaggerative words, regulatory alignment, no regulatory divergence, and, and so on. But the broad principle is, is, is mutual recognition and, and, and compatibility. Uh, that's, that's, that's the problem there. There's, there's also... Uh, a, 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 a political issue in, in that whether it's the customs union or the single market, which is mainly a, about regulation, a fear that you will not preserve the current position, which is that Northern Ireland has an open border both to the Republic and to the United Kingdom. So whatever solution you have, people talked about border in the Irish Sea, that doesn't resolve the problem, that's still, that's still a border. And for the nationalist community, having a border of any sort, or, or a stronger border, a deeper border, I should say, uh, is, is, is a political red line. And for the unionist community, having a border with GB is, is a red line. And I can understand where they're both coming from, because it's important, almost psychologically, for the agreement to work, that you can have these open borders uh, and that you can have the free movement of people across both of those borders. Thank you. Um, yeah, no, I was just going to ask, um, to some extent you've answered it, I think, but just this binary model of devolved latitude and centralised supremacy of Westminster, unity and diversity, whatever we call it, can this twin track strategy continue after departure? You're referring to the division of competences between yeah. the two levels. Well, yes, the feature of devolution in Scotland and Northern Ireland and, and now in Wales is a, is a pretty clear division of powers between the two levels because of the reserve uh, model that everything is devolved if it's not explicitly reserved uh, and that has a number of advantages. One is it's pretty clear where any given competence lies. There have been very few disputes uh, in Scotland, almost none between the UK and the Scottish Government, one or two in Wales in the transition. Uh, it, it also allows uh, the devolved governments broad capacity to make policy. They don't have to keep on going back to the statute book and seeing whether they've got the power to do one thing or another. They can mix and match policies in various ways. Uh, and it, it allows greater transparency and accountability because we pretty much know where, where powers uh, lie. And that's, that's worked pretty well compared mm -hmm. with other systems. But inevitably, there are areas of overlap. There are commonalities, uh, and there have been arrangements put in place to deal with those in the devolution uh, settlement. Now, uh, after Brexit, those common areas may, may increase. Similarly, with the recent devolution of, of some welfare powers, there's more uh, overlap. Uh, and some of my colleagues in political science will tell you, that's fine, that's the way the world is, let's not go for these watertight divisions of powers. But there are problems there. Uh, uh, and I think the model we have in Scotland is, is, is a good one because it does make for clarity. So the more you move from separated or devolved and reserved powers towards shared powers, mm. then the more problems you get about deciding who can do what. There are problems of transparency, knowing who's accountable for what. And these intergovernmental arrangements that are used for managing joint affairs tend to be precisely that intergovernmental and parliaments tend to be uh, excluded. So where possible, governments across Europe have been trying to get away from that, trying to get some more clarity as to where responsibility lies, bearing in mind that there can never be complete clarity. There's always going to be some overlap and we need mechanisms for dealing with that. So how can shared uh, powers and frameworks fit within the reserve powers model? Right, now the term frameworks has just come into the debate uh, as a result of Brexit. We, we never talked about frameworks before. Uh, and we don't have framework laws within the UK devolution settlement. Uh, a framework law is a law where both levels have responsibility for a given policy field. Uh, the higher layer sets the basic parameters, and within that, the, uh, the devolved or, or the federated units can, can make policy. So is this the same as what the, an EU law would call it's, it's, shared it's, it's, competence? It's, it's, the, the EU law is based upon that. A shared principle. competence. Yeah, yeah. The EU, the EU operates on that principle. We don't operate on that principle. But if we're going to download EU frameworks into the United Kingdom Constitution, 
then we've got to work out what that means. And, and there's been very little thought given to that in the debate in, in, in the last few months, because it is a new principle. How would frameworks operate? How constraining would they be? How can we avoid the problems that have arisen in other countries? Because in Germany, they've got rid of framework laws. Uh, they're problematic in Spain and in Italy. How can we make sure that the system is going to work properly? Uh, and that if we're going to take over the European frameworks, are we going to operate them the way the EU does, or are we going to operate them in a different way? Because EU frameworks are negotiated, suggested by uh, the Commission, uh, adopted by the Council of the European Union, that's the Council of Ministers, with 28 member states, with qualified majority voting. We don't have anything like that. Subject to the principle of proportionality and subsidiarity, uh, and you can go to the courts, the, the governments can go to the courts, parliaments can go to the courts, if you think that's been uh, violated, uh, and then there's a legal mechanism to enforce those frameworks. We don't have anything like that in the United Kingdom Constitution. So it behoves us to, to, to think about that if we're moving towards that framework instrument, just what we mean and how, how would it operate. Marcus Fish. Um, so what other than having those discussions that you just mentioned, should, should we be doing uh, to think about what is required or what else should we be, we be doing to uh, do what is required to create and regulate a UK internal market while respecting the devolution settlements? Well, you, you, you mentioned the phrase UK internal market, and that's something that, that, that's worth thinking about. Uh, it only features in the Northern Ireland uh, Act. It doesn't feature in the Scotland and, and Wales Acts, but it's implicit. that We, we sort of understand what that means. Uh, but once you get into detail about the UK single market, it becomes quite contentious. What, what about public procurement? What about state aid? Uh, again, it's worth thinking about what that really means, what has to be uniform across the UK, and what instruments you need not just to deal with the present-day problems, but to anticipate other things that might come up. My, one example of that from the European context is the minimum pricing of alcohol in, in Scotland that was introduced as a public me health measure. Its opponents say, no, that's a single market measure. It violates the European single market. And it took several years to resolve. It went all the way up the court system and back down again uh, here before it was resolved. So a general principle like that will have multiple interpretations. So we need to think, what does that principle really mean? Uh, and how can we put in place mechanisms to, uh, to deal with it? If the single market is, 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 the, is the one that's been addressed, but there are, there are other things about, about welfare. Well, what about different welfare rights and so on? How, how much commonality do we, do, do we need there? That's a debate we never had at the time of devolution because it didn't seem to be important, partly because Europe dealt with those kinds of things. But if Europe's no longer dealing with those things, then it's again, it's again worth thinking about what that might actually mean. And, and I say, ultimately, a lot of this is a matter of political judgment. So we, 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 there's no scientific answer to what that means. Mm. It, it depends on your political predilections in many ways. And what would be your comment on the extent to which the uniqueness of Northern Ireland's, Northern Ireland's position uh, within that means? Well, Northern Ireland is, is, is obviously within the European single market. After Brexit, uh, everybody in Northern Ireland wants to keep access to, to the UK market. They don't want obstacles there. But there's also a, a, an all-Ireland single market, which is really quite important. It's very important in agriculture. It's important in energy. It has some importance in, in some sectors uh, as well. So how can you keep Northern Ireland with full access to both those single markets, because they're important economically, but they're also extremely important politically. It's, this notion of an all-island market uh, is a very important reference point for the nationalist community to be able to say to them, you don't need to separate, you don't need to get rid of the border, because you still have access to the all-island market and can participate in many ways in the social, cultural, and political life of, of, on an all-island basis. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on to David Jones. Professor Keating, um, as you know, the uh, government has now made proposals to amend the EU uh, withdrawal bill so that the presumption will be that repatriated powers will reside at a devolved level 
and uh, that Westminster will only uh, have a role in terms of making temporary regulations to protect the uh, UK uh, internal market um, or uh, to carry out international obligations. Um, and that, of course, has already been accepted, I think, by the Welsh administration. Uh, how significant uh, a change is this to the bill? It, it is a significant change because initially Clause 11 says that all retained EU law will go back to Westminster until such time as the UK government will release the powers. They then shifted and said, well, we can release some powers immediately, and then they said there will be a limited uh, list of powers, and then they said that we will release all powers, all powers will go back to the devolved, except the ones we specify, reserving, reversing that assumption of uh, reservation of powers. And that, that, that was a very significant move. And on their side, the devolved government said, we will accept frameworks. We have no problem with frameworks. It just depends on how they're negotiated. And then the UK government said that this reservation of powers, which will be done by statutory order, will have a sunset clause, uh, and it will be subject effectively to the Sewell Convention, which statutory instruments normally aren't. So th th these were considerable moves, I think, that are really very important. That really got us back to the status quo ante, uh, because that, that got us back to the position we had before. Assumption of reservation, uh, consent for change of that, the Sewell provision for uh, changing that. Uh, but it didn't resolve a problem that was there even in the old system which is what happens when legislative consent is not given. Now, that problem has been avoided hitherto. Governments have got around it. Uh, both governments have, have respected the division of competence. But with Brexit, it's very difficult to, to do. Now, that Sewell Convention was reinforced following the Scottish independence referendum in the Scotland Act of 2016 and the Wales Act of 2017. It was written down, but as the Supreme Court reminded us in the Miller case, it still wasn't legally binding. That raises the interesting question of how binding it is. What is a convention? Uh, and I've argued before that a convention is, is not a binding law, but it's not just a political agreement either. Conventions are the basis for our constitution, the, the unwritten constitution we have in this country. Uh, and both levels have, for obvious and very good reasons, tried to avoid facing that question uh, because it doesn't have an answer. So let's just, just work around. Now it is posed. Uh, and the latest amendment that the UK government has tabled uh, says the Seal Convention will apply, in so many words, they restate it. But then they say if legislative consent is given, or legislative consent is withheld, or there's no answer to the quest for legislative consent, the outcome will be exactly the same. So they've chosen to highlight this anomaly in, in, in the thing. We've got a convention, but it, it is not, not, not enforceable. But nevertheless, that's been accepted by the, the, the Welsh uh, the, the Welsh, the Welsh government. government has accepted it, and the Scottish government hasn't. There, there is a difference there. But as I say, that's always been there in the devolution settlement. It's just been highlighted by the uh, Brexit debate and, and the need to do something about these competences. Does it matter that it's been highlighted, given that everybody knew it was there all, uh, all, all the time? Uh, Yes, because here I'm, I'm not speaking as a lawyer because I'm not a lawyer, uh, but politically, uh, this was a compromise. Uh, politically, it was saying, yes, we'll respect your competences, but we'll have a fallback where uh, we will uh, be able to, to legislate uh, uh, anyway, uh, and we'll try not to talk about it. But once you write it down in such an explicit way, then people start say, talking well, about know, it. We're just drawing attention to that anomaly, and we're not resolving it. Yes. Well, to, to what extent do, do you think that the, pro, the, the latest proposals actually uh, respect the constitutional uh, balance under the uh, devolution settlements, which is, I guess, what we've just been talking about? But yeah, yeah, yes, they, 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 they do. As I say, the UK government has, has moved and it's accepted the principle of reservation. It's accepted... Uh, that the Seal Convention should apply, and even extended it to statutory instruments. Uh, but on the other hand, you could say that the Seal Convention, post Scotland Act of 2016, Wales Act of 2017, when it was, has failed its first test, 
because those two acts were supposed to resolve the question by saying this is the situation, but th in a very ambivalent way. Uh, and just when it would really matter, you could say it failed the test because the UK government says ultimately it doesn't make any difference. But that, of we, course, we, we uh, that. As, as you rightly say, is, is set out on the face of both the Scotland yeah. and, and the Wales Act. So yeah, knew, it, it was, we, if you like, expressly ambivalent. But we, but, we, but we knew that in law, so the Supreme Court didn't tell us anything new. Yes. But, but, but what is the difference between the black letter law and a constitutional convention? That is the big question, because most of our constitution is based upon conventions. And following the Scottish referendum and the Smith Commission and the two acts I referred to, there was an understanding emerging in practice that the UK government wouldn't just intervene just because it wanted to. And, and, and that was being respected. Brexit now then has posed, uh, put a burden on that convention that it's just not capable of bearing. And it hadn't had time to bed in before Brexit came along. That's why we got ourselves into this position. The fudge that was in there doesn't work for Brexit. Uh, and so we've got these two interpretations of the Constitution clashing. Now, I can't speak for either government, but it seems to me that it's implicit in there, right when I was talking about the nature of the state, is it unity of the state or whatever, it's always been implicit they have two visions of the Constitution, but they're always able to work around them. Here we now have an instance of it becoming uh, very explicit. Now, I don't know what's going to happen on Wednesday. Maybe there will be a compromise, but I'm just trying to explain where, where the two sides seem to be coming from and where these two visions of the Constitution do clash. To what extent does the acceptance by the Welsh uh, government uh, of this proposal um, put pressure on the, the Scottish government, if you like, to, to, to fall in line? Well, I, 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 I don't know. That's, that's, that's a political question. Obviously, the Scottish government is more exposed than it was in, in, in the past, and, and the fact that the Welsh government is not a nationalist, pro-independence government made, made a difference to that. But I think what is being defended here, and, and I don't make any comment about whether the Scottish Government are right in, in maintaining their opposition, this is, this is, this is a, an issue about the nature of the Constitution and whether we are to see this as some kind of deeply entrenched federal arrangement or, or, or not. And the understanding in Scotland was following the referendum that the devolution settlement would be more strongly entrenched some way or other. Uh, and it, it, we've not got there yet. We've not got the kind of understandings that we need uh, to make this system work. Because this may come up again. Uh, and uh, it's not just over the withdrawal bill, but these um, clauses will have a seven year sunset clause between, well, up to seven years, two plus five. Uh, but we may still need frameworks after that. So this may come up again and again. And, and the, the other concern I have with the way that the two sides have gone about talking about the division of competences is that instead of talking about general principles like the internal market we're discussing now and saying, well, how, how can we have some general principles for operating across the UK? They've gone into individual, very detailed competences. Yeah. Uh, and, and that might be too wide a list or it might be too narrow a list because we don't know what's going to come up in the future, particularly with regard to international trade deals. So whatever happens, there's got to be some longer-term mechanism for dealing with this problem. Thank you. Can I just ask a supplementary? In his uh, February speech uh, about Clause 11, basically, David Lidgington said, and I quote, nor would this proposed arrangement prevent the devolved governments from doing anything that is already within their competence, unquote. How much do you give your assent to that assertion? Well, it just, at, at that stage, we, we, we didn't know what the framework was going to look like. Uh, we didn't know what they were going to uh, contain. But certainly within the EU frameworks, the Scottish government has a very large room for discretion because it, within agriculture, it has, um, it has all the discretion that the UK government has as a member state is devolved down to Scotland. So there is a, a, a very distinct capacity for, 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 for making policy there. It depends on what the frameworks would, would mean. And, and I think it's becoming clearer now what they would mean. And, and, and I don't think the UK government is, is it engaged in any kind of power grab. I, I, I don't see why they would want to do that. Uh, I, I think there's just been a neglect 
uh, all the way through the process of the nature of the devolution settlements and, and the, the yeah. way it, it works. Uh, and I'm thinking about the longer term, uh, how policy will be made in, in the longer term, what issues will come up in the future, and I'm just worried that if we get a short-term settlement to get the withdrawal bill through, we won't have the mechanisms in place for the next time this comes up, which it may come up in relation to foreign trade deals, it may come up in relation to so reinterpretation of the single so, market. So you're hoping that um, eventually the Scottish Government will accept this compromise, or perhaps a bit more of a compromise, but will they accept a compromise? Well, I don't, I don't know. Um, so that's, that's, that's a matter of political okay. judgment. But, but, but what I do know is that, that uh, however this list of powers is resolved, it's not going to provide a long-term solution to this problem. No. No. Okay. Kelvin Hopkins. Thank you, Chair. Um, I wonder if you could briefly explain what the Scottish withdrawal from the European Union Legal Continuity Scotland Bill is and what it would do. Yeah, well, I was, I was wholly, hoping that my, my colleague Ian would be here to explain the, the legalities of it. But, but I'll, I'll try and do my best that it would incorporate directly into Scottish law all those repatriated European competences that lie within the competence of the Scottish Parliament. And in that way, preempt the uh, withdrawal bill uh, in, in the form, well, whatever form it takes, mm. by saying, well, the powers immediately come back to Scotland. Now, that's going to the Supreme Court, and I have no idea what the Supreme Court uh, will say. Um, it, that, 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 that clearly is, is a political gesture to say, because the UK government, we know, can get its way anyway, whatever the continuity bill says. Westminster can countermand that, if it really wants to, Sewell Convention notwithstanding. That's, there's a political uh, battle about that, but it also says one or two other interesting things as well, uh, which, which, which may, even, may survive, even if the withdrawal bill were, were withdrawn. Uh, one is that it incorporates the Charter of Fundamental Rights from the European Union into the law of, of Scotland, so that those repatriated competences would be subject to the Charter. Now, there's also a debate about this in the House of Lords as well, whether that should be done for the UK as a whole. Uh, and secondly, it would allow Scotland, or, or give Scottish ministers the powers unilaterally to align with European regulations in, in areas that are devolved, so that Scotland would remain closer to European regulations and European rules, so keeping its effective capacity to work within European policy systems within devolved fields. Uh, and those other two things, it seems to me, are, 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 are quite, quite interesting and, and worth thinking about because they don't, they don't challenge the Union or challenge Westminster supremacy. They open up the possibility that of the devolved territories maybe having a slightly different relationship with, with European regulations than the rest of the United Kingdom does. And you don't think the United Kingdom government would be hostile to it necessarily. Um, it strikes me as being a bit of a belt and braces bill. You know, if the, if the withdrawal bill belt doesn't cover all bases, your bill would fill in the gap, so to speak. Well, well it would mean that, well, the, the last bit would, would mean that Scottish ministers have the power effectively to adopt European regulation. Now, the Scottish Parliament could do that anyway by primary legislation, but it provides a, a mechanism for Scottish ministers to be able to keep up with European regulations as, as, as they change. Uh, that's, that's just a matter of, of public policy. Uh, Preempting the withdrawal bill, that seems to be essentially a political issue because ultimately we know that Westminster can get its way if it wants to. Uh, Even if the Supreme Court allows this bill, Westminster could say, no, we, we, we're yeah. not going to permit it. You, you, you could be take, take, take in... Um, parallel legislation to European, the EU legislation itself, but you wouldn't necessarily, obviously wouldn't be governed by the European Court of Justice or anything of that kind. It would just be yeah. imitating what the EU has done and, and yeah. adopting similar, similar laws. Uh, which, yes, which, yes. Uh, which, but, England, but, which but, UK is going to do anyway, I think, in many cases. Well, we don't know. Um, we, we, we don't know how far the UK is going to maintain uh, alignment with European regulations on, on whatever basis in order to keep access to the market. But yes, indeed, that would allow the Scottish government to go further than the UK in, in that regulatory line. And also, the, the, the European Court of Justice would not, of course, uh, have control over these things, but it could even incorporate decisions of the European Court of Justice, which a lot of the single market 
comes from, the, the way it's interpreted by the court. Just going back to one of your previous comments, um, it stri it's always struck me that Scotland is, in philosophical terms, to the left of the rest of the UK, well, certainly England. Um, and uh, if you look at uh, free university tuition, um, free long-term care, public ownership, water, and so on, and you specifically referred to public procurement and state aids, which would be outside what the EU would allow, um, but something that might be very popular with, with, with in Scotland, and certainly I would support that personally. But um, do, do you not think that it would provide opportunities for Scotland to pursue its much more social democratic, even socialist agenda? That's 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 possible. Uh, the the free personal care just doesn't doesn't come into this at all because it's got nothing to do with European regulations. Mm. Uh, the fee regime obliges Scotland to allow European students to come to Scotland and study without paying fees. And that obligation would go uh, yes. after Brexit. State aids and public procurement, uh, that's the kind of thing that would, might come into UK single market uh, regulations. But whatever conception we have of a UK single market would probably have some common regime about state aids, otherwise you get unfair competition or a uh, race to the bottom in, in subsidies across the United Kingdom, and nobody would really want that because it'd just be destructive for, uh, for everybody. But I think what, what, what the Scottish, well, what Scottish parliamentarians, because not just, just the government, might have in mind would be uh, environmental regulation, uh, we, we could, if, if, we, and if, if it were the case that the European standards were higher than UK standards, or that, the Scottish government could go for that higher level. Uh, regulations in, in, in animal health, um, labour market regulation is not devolved, but there is a case for arguing it. That's, that's the things people are talking about, and maybe that would be devolved in, in the future. So it's, it's a relatively small area. Uh, <coughs> it, it doesn't cover the main issues of economic or welfare policy. Uh, but it's just a way in which Scotland could stay a bit closer to the EU than the rest of the United Kingdom. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. Uh, moving on to... Oh, yes, Marcus, you wanted to chip in. Um, yes, please. I, I just wanted to ask what would happen if the UK Parliament were unable to pass the EU withdrawal bill? Would this continuity bill be able to be implemented? Um, I, 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 yes, I assume so. I mean, if, if, they, if the UK government weren't able to pass the withdrawal bill, I, I, do you mean if, if, if it were voted down? If I, it were uh, voted down, if it wasn't uh, possible but, to get it through the House of Lords, if, if they well, just point blank refused to approve it? Well, and we had to use the Parliament Act, and it took two years. Well, yes, I think you'd have a constitutional crisis there, and the Scottish issue would be a sideshow. I, <laughs> I, I don't think that's going to happen. I, 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 there's no evidence that the House of Lords would be attempting to do that. But just imagine that the withdrawal bill were to disappear. Then I suppose the continuity bill would be there. Uh, but but whether, whether the Supreme Court will accept it, because the presiding officer of the Scottish Parliament says it's not competent, the advocate, the Lord Advocate says it is competent, so there's, a, there's an argument amongst lawyers as to whether it is competent, and uh, I can't answer that question because I'm not a lawyer. Well, we will find an answer from someone else. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we're going to have to skip along a little bit more quickly uh, if we're going to keep to time, so can I ask colleagues and, um, and our witness please to give short and crisp answers. Uh, we're moving on to uh, David Jones. Yes, w what... Uh what mechanisms exist in the uh, Scotland Act to ensure uh, that all areas, all parts of the UK comply with international obligations entered into by the British government? Yeah, there, there, there is a clause saying that the that UK ministers can, if, I, I won't give you the precise wording, I don't remember it, I'll give you the gist, C can instruct Scottish ministers to give effect to international obligations. It doesn't instruct the Scottish Parliament, it instructs Scottish ministers, uh, 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 whether that would override the act of the Scottish Parliament, you'd have to ask uh, a lawyer. There's been a question of whether that is 
the right kind of power to have because it's not being used as far as I know. Uh, and certainly it was, it was intended as some kind of backstop unless there was some kind of emergency, some problem of non-compliance, which there has not been. But as more and more regulation ceases to be European law and becomes international treaty law, including our future relationship with the EU and then trade deals with third parties, the number of cases where that arises is going to be much greater. Uh, and uh, I think it would at least looking at that and seeing whether that power is, is adequate, uh, whether it is something that could be incorporated in a general set of principles. I was talking about frameworks before as a principle that we would understand something like that. Uh, I think would probably be more satisfactory that what was in, than what was intended just as a fallback power. And then the other side of that, if, if there is a requirement that devolved legislatures as well as governments give effect to international trade agreements or other international obligations, it could be in the environment or anything, then uh, those devolved uh, institutions should have an input into the making of those treaties. Uh, some kind of in, way in which they can express their concerns about what's in those treaties. So to accommodate this, do you think that there is going to be need for new primary legislation amending the devolution settlements? I, I, I don't know. Again, that's, that's, that's a legal question. And, and it, it just, just seems to me uh, that that power was intended for a different purpose. It was intended as an emergency override uh, and that if we're going to have a regular penetration of devolved law by international treaty instead of European law, there's probably a better way of, of doing it on a regular basis. And again, putting in place conventions whereby the devolves were at least consulted on how this might affect their devolved competences. Okay. I'm not talking about a veto, that, but, but some way in which uh, they could be consulted. Thank you. Rupert Huck? Um, yeah, we've heard um, several recommendations, even when we went to Cardiff on a similar visit, that intergovernmental relations need to be placed on a statutory footing now. Um, what might such legislation look like and what mechanisms would be needed to be put in place to formalise these? I, I wouldn't start with, with institutions and committees and mechanisms like that because if you set up institutions without giving them something to do, then they atrophy. This is what happened to joint ministerial committees. They just stopped meeting because there was nothing to talk about. I'd start with general principles, we, we go, going back to this notion of what the single market is, going back to this idea about what are the implications of international agreement, start at that point. Uh, you might have to address the status of the Cyril Convention. Uh, in other devolved or federal systems, there is a fallback mechanism as to what to do when there is a deadlock. And in no case does it say the central parliament will just resolve the matter. I haven't found a single case where that happens. There's always some mechanism for constitutional uh, amendment involving the, the devolved or federated units, usually involving qualified majorities, the second chamber, some way in which when there is deadlock, the centre can't unilaterally get its way. And once you've established that principle, then everything else follows because it provides an incentive to cooperate. You know what the rules are, you know what the fallback is, you don't want a constitutional crisis. Uh, and so the devolved level is not simply saying, well, we'd like you to take our position into account, but we realise you don't have an obligation to. Now, if you have that mechanism, then I, I think you can, you can build on that, you can identify ways in which to avoid that kind of conflict. Uh, and, and then I would work around policy fields. The joint, problem with the joint ministerial committees is that they only worked where there was a policy field that was really relevant. And so they worked in relation to the European Union because you need, before the meetings of the European uh, Council or the, the Council of the European Union, to have common positions. Uh, they, they worked to some degree in agriculture because there's a lot of common interest uh, there. In Spain, they do this with what they call sectoral conferences. They look at the big policy fields and organize meetings uh, around that. Uh, and they also have a, a mechanism for voting there, which says that, and I'm not saying we should reproduce this, but it's just an interesting that there is voting. The central government has the same number of votes as the autonomous communities put together. So neither side can overrule the other side without getting some, 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 some support there. So some kind of under, underpinning uh, would be extremely useful because it wouldn't just be become 
there wouldn't be the possibility of unilateral uh, imposition. Uh, and then some serious thought about where these issues might arise. And, and most issues we can forget about. Where are these going to be important? What are the important fields? And, and put in mechanisms to deal with those. I mean, just in Cardiff, it felt that they um, hadn't got their meeting yet with... I think David Liddington was due to meet them. I don't know, they felt a bit forgotten, and they... Um, we've well, not had mean, the equivalent they're, they're, session they're, here they're, they're, There were complaints about the mm. Joint Ministerial Side Committee on European view. Negotiations uh, from, 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 the, from both, both Scotland and, and, and Wales. I'm uh, interested to know what, uh, um, I think you described, uh, set out a, a set of general principles... What would this set of principles look like? Is there anything like that in existence at the moment? No, no, there isn't. This is where we get back to frameworks and yes. what should be in frameworks. Uh, and, and, and my suggestion that frameworks shouldn't have detailed list of competencies to argue about, but broad principles and some way to interpret those. About how to conduct intergovernmental relations. And yeah, or, 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 or what, 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 the, what a single market looks like, what kind of things that we, we think might be important. Broadly defined, so we don't have to creep but, on. But in, terms, in terms of the basic set of principles for intergovernmental relations, I mean, you have in your mind's eye what that would look like. Uh, yes, it, w it would require. Well, it, it would require a recognition in Westminster that there are circumstances where it won't get its own way. Uh, very challenging. That, that is very challenging. That's a challenge to Westminster sovereignty, where we started off. Uh, but, but, but that's what a constitution, a devolved constitution, a federal constitution, looks like. That's, that's the critical one. Uh, and if you have that, I think you might reduce the number of conflicts because there will be an incentive to agree. Kelvin Hopkins? Yes, my question really follows on from what Rupert and the Chair have been saying. But intergovernmental relations, if they are formalised, what role should there be for parliamentary scrutiny mm. rather than um, the executive? For example, should there be an inter-parliamentary council with a scrutiny role, or should that role fall to the individual parliaments and assemblies? And I, I think one of the significant points here is that most uh, members of the European Union have different electoral systems, to us, which tends to give more power to legislatures than to executives. And I think that's probably true of Scotland and Wales as well. But England, because it's first past the post, strongly gives very great power to the executive. Um, so, what role for Parliament? Uh, yes, the, the question of England, of course, by the way, is one we haven't come to. It's, I think it's, a, I think it's a, really, a, really, a really big one which has to be resolved, who speaks for England. But as far as the Parliaments are concerned, yeah, this is, this is a a weakness in the present system. In, in all countries where you have a lot of intergovernmental relations, parliaments tend to be marginalized, agreements are made in closed forums, they're not subject to scrutiny, there's a problem of accountability and that really does need to be addressed. And I know all the legislatures around the United Kingdom are, have been concerned with that. There's been some experimentation around this in relation to the European Union and how European policy making works because the same criticism is made uh, that how do we control our governments who go to the Council of the European Union and negotiate on our behalf and there are places, Denmark is one example where ministers have to come to the parliament before and after meetings, they have to explain what the negotiating remit is they have to explain afterwards what, what they've done and as I keep on telling members of the Scottish Parliament, you don't need the UK Parliament's permission to do that you, you can just do that yourself. You can summon ministers here and tell us what they're doing when they go to London and, 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 and negotiate. It requires a, a willingness on the part of the parliaments to, to, to exert themselves. And then on the interparliamentary dimension, again, I think it would be extremely useful to have more contact amongst the parliaments. There is a common shared interest in scrutiny of executives there that, that transcend any, any partisan political uh, divisions. There have been moves in that direction, but the problem with these things is that people always say, we don't have time, or we're too busy doing other things. But again, they could, if they were prepared to invest time in that, get much better coordination, joint meetings, joint inquiries uh, on, in, in, in common problems. So th there's a lot, without changing the devolution settlement, without changing the law, there's a lot more could be done. Just a brief comment, there are three members of our team today, who are members of the European Scrutiny Committee at Westminster as well. And there is some tension between the EU Scrutiny Committee and government and ministers. Mm -hmm. Getting ministers to come to talk yes. to us is sometimes quite difficult. Anyway, just a yeah. comment. Mm -hmm. uh, Marcus Fish. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
Yes, you, you referred earlier, Professor Keating, to um, some, uh, what, what a federal system looks, looks like. That is what it looks like. Um, what would be the constitutional implications of making intergovernmental and interparliamentary relations more of a permanent feature of the constitutional settlement? And you mentioned the England question, obviously, that, that, yeah, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, that would yeah, have to yeah, be addressed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, can I come to, to, to England then? Because I, th I think that's one of the biggest issues within this. Uh, who speaks for England? Is the UK government also a separate voice for England? Uh, the difficulty fitting England into the Constitution is, is that with England, within England itself, there's, there's no consensus about how that should be done. English votes for English laws, is that the answer? An English parliament, not a lot of support for that. English regions, well, that was tried. City regions is being tried at the moment. It doesn't resolve this particular problem. So we just have to work uh, around that. But it does mean that whatever system we have uh, is going to be asymmetrical in a very serious way, in a, in a way that doesn't exist in, in any other country where 85% of the population belongs in one unit. Uh, there have been suggestions in relation to intergovernmental machinery and whatever comes out of, of Brexit and these new frameworks that, that there, there should be a separation between England and the UK. Ministers attending this should be English ministers or UK ministers. It happened a bit in the past in the Joint Ministerial Committee for Europe. One minister was given the responsibility of speaking for England and another was presiding on behalf of, of, of the UK. I, I think that's the way we'll, we'll probably be moving, uh, but as long as there's no consensus within England about this is going to, how this is going to be handled, then it's very difficult to, to, to do anything. People here talk about a federal UK, but if the English don't want that, then we've got no right, to, we, we can't impose on the English something that they, they, they don't want. We've just got to work around it. Mm. Just as a follow-up, Chair, um, I'm also on the International Trade Committee of the House of Commons, and one one inquiry that we're intending to undertake is the way that we um, achieve buy-in of the different parts of the political economy for potentially thinking about new international treaty obligations. And I was just wondering um, uh, whether um, you thought that giving, um, giving the constitutional discussions uh, a practical uh, practical tasks such as that might might be a be a context in which to experiment with with such uh, new ways of talking to each other. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely vital that the joint committees of race be given a job to do. Otherwise, people just don't turn up. So, so yeah, it, it, it might be useful to start off with some key issues and say, let's work on that, and then see how the practice develops from from that. Yeah. And are there any other spheres of public life other than international trade where you think uh, that would be important? That well, uh, everything that might be covered by UK frameworks would be to do, which would be to do with the single market and things like competition, com competition law, notably. People talk about state aids, but that's just a subsidiary category of a much bigger thing called competition law, which is downloaded from you. Environmental policy is, is, is another one, common resources, uh, cross-border issues, infrastructure. Uh, th these are the kinds of things where it might be useful to work on concrete tasks. Uh, like a lot of the stuff that's done in, in, in Ireland uh, across the border is about very specific things, hospitals, roads, bridges, uh, where there's a clear task and a clear common interest. Okay, thank you. Well, um, Professor Keating, it's been um, fantastic. How, how we would have fitted you in to the hour we allocated <laughs> if Aileen McCarg had been there as well? I don't know, but um, we've been hanging on your every word. It's been a really fantastic session. Just one last thought. You know, what else should we do or can be done to build up more trust and mutual respect between Westminster and Holyrood? Well, I think, I think trust <laughs> comes from from institutions. Trust comes from knowing what, what the rules are. Uh, and, uh, and it comes from practice. Uh, and following devolution, we didn't have the crises that people 
thought we'd have. We even got through the Scottish independence referendum uh, and were able to put together a system after that, get agreement on a new bill and get agreement on uh, the civil convention uh, until, until Brexit came along. That produced a, a, sh a shock to the system. Uh, and even with various combinations of different political conventions, a lot of common work did go on. So I, I don't subscribe to the notion that there was any kind of crisis in devolution. I think the arrangements were generally working, but they could have been uh, improved. Uh, but trust knows from, stems from knowing that the other side has got to cooperate with you and you've got to cooperate with them. That's a hard-headed view of what trust is. It's not people being nice to each other. It's people knowing there are games here, there are rules, and we've got to play by those rules. Uh, but where there's that uncertainty uh, and where one side ultimately holds all the cards, it's very difficult to get that trust relationship. Uh, but surely involved. trust is an act of faith, isn't it? It's not about well, knowing the other side's obliged to do something. Well, um, I'm supposed to be the area very academic and you're the hard-headed politicians. I think it's, I think it's, about, I think it's about power as well. I think that really does matter. Well, thank you very much. Um, yeah. And it's been extremely good. We're going to take a 20-minute adjournment now to catch our breath before our next panel. Yeah. Order, order. Okay.
And we're very pleased to welcome uh, four Scottish parliamentarians, uh, if I've got that right, four members of the Scottish Parliament. Um, and could I ask each of you to identify yourselves from the record, please? Okay, uh, Willie Rennie, I'm leader of the Scottish Liberal Democrats. Uh, I'm Richard Leonard, I'm the leader of the Scottish Labour Party. I'm Adam Tompkins, I'm the Constitutional Affairs Spokesman for the Scottish Conservatives. I'm Patrick Harvey, I'm co-convener of the Scottish Green Party. We don't do leaders. I understand that. Thank you very much indeed. And we'll need to crack on at a fairly speedy pace. So if somebody has given you the answer that you would have given, you can just say, I agree. Uh, That'll be the first uh, thing. We don't need to uh, linger. Um, and I will start, if I may, um, with the EU withdrawal bill. Um, and the new amendment which the government has tabled in the House of Lords, which changes the presumption so that powers uh, now rest with the devolved level and Westminster will only be involved uh, in making temporary regulations to protect UK common interests or international obligations while common positions and frameworks are being agreed. So in your, each of your views, how does this change the substance and effect of the original Clause 11? Well, it turns it on its head, Mr Chairman. So the, um, uh, as you will know, the um, Scottish Parliament's Finance and Constitution Committee, on which I sit and Patrick Harvey also sits, um, was unanimous uh, in its report a few months ago that the original Clause 11 um, was incompatible with our devolution settlement. And it was incompatible with our devolution settlement because it turned the fundamental of that settlement on its head. So one of, the fun, one of the founding principles of devolution um, in Scotland, and has been since 1999, and now also in Wales, um, is that um, everything is devolved apart from that which is expressly uh, reserved under the schedules to the Scotland Act 1998. And the effect of the original Clause 11 was unfortunately to, to, to turn that round. The amendments um, published um, by the government last week um, reversed that, um, and in my view, I mean, uh, this is only my view, but in my view, uh, the amendments uh, are fully compatible with the recommendations and conclusions that the Finance and Constitution Committee came to in its interim report a few months ago. Patrick Harvey. Well, I disagree with uh, Adam Tompkins on, on much of that. Um, yes, the Finance and Constitution Committee was unanimous uh, at the time of looking at the original uh, EU withdrawal bill and said that Section 11 was, was incompatible with devolution. Uh, I think the amendments which have been published remain incompatible with uh, the devolution settlement, uh, in particular the introduction of restrictions on uh, actions that the, the Scottish Parliament or the Scottish Ministers can take uh, unless uh, you know, the, the, the questions of, of consent have been dealt with. And, and to define consent to define legislative consent uh, as the Scottish Parliament saying yes and the Scottish Parliament saying no and the Scottish Parliament saying neither. That is in no way a meaningful definition of consent. Whether in, in legislation or any other walk of life, consent has to be freely given without coercion. It has to be capable of being withdrawn at any time and fundamentally it has to be respected. Uh, and uh, Section 30A in the, the new amendments uh, very clearly uh, make uh, uh, no fundamental respect for that legislative uh, consent process. And let's remember that we're just a, a very brief time since the last Scotland Act, which uh, purported, purported to put into practice the recommendation of the Smith Commission, again on which Adam Tompkins and I were both members, which recommended that the Sewell Convention, that legislative consent convention, should be put on a statutory basis. Well, it was put on a statutory basis for five minutes, and then the coach and horses was driven through it, no. and I'm afraid that remains the case. No. Uh, 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 maybe one of um, uh, Richard Leonard or Willie Brennan would like to respond to that. I mean, my, my view, there has been some significant movement, um, but we still haven't got to the, the central issues, which is how do you resolve a dispute? Um, and Westminster having the final say is not a dispute resolution procedure you need to have some kind of mechanism where the devolved institutions and the United Kingdom government are able to agree without the Westminster having the final clout or if there needs to be a much better way of doing that. So we still haven't tackled that fundamental problem yet, whether they're fundamentally devolved for a time period or they were reserved for a time period 
it doesn't matter. We still need to so solve it. So who should it. have the final say? I think there needs to be a co-decision-making procedure on issues of common interest and common power, which I think this is. We need to create a level playing field across the United Kingdom for, for um, the EU withdrawal bill, and the Westminster having the final say isn't sufficient. There needs to be some kind of mechanism around about perhaps you know, qualified majority voting of, of sorts. Um, but that so would that be like the Sewell Convention saying, instead of normally, saying never. You, yeah, you could, you could go down something like that, but what you well, can't I mean, have, the, the point is, the Sewell Convention doesn't say never, it says normally. Yes, exactly. So it's because it is just a convention, and it always has been a convention. Um, but the issue is whether you're moving from a veto to... Um, overwhelming power, and that's where we've got, still got a problem. So that's why you need to have a dispute resolution procedure. Richard Lennon. Yeah, I mean, up until now, the, uh, the devolution settlement uh, founded around the 1998 Act has worked well. And it's only now that uh, the Supreme Court has been uh, called upon to, um, um, to adjudicate over um, a piece of legislation which the Scottish Parliament has passed. And I think underlying a lot of this is a complete breakdown of trust and I have to say that the responsibility for that breakdown of trust, I think, lies with the way that the UK government uh, approached the withdrawal bill with regard to the devolution settlement. I think, you know, Adam Tompkins is right. There were members of the Conservative Party in the Scottish Parliament who also understood that there had been a failure, whether it was a failure in Whitehall or Westminster, to grasp the fact of devolution. Now, there has been some remedial action taken to address that, and I think I agree uh, that there has been uh, a, a, a degree of movement uh, which has provided for um, uh, people now to think about uh, reaching settlement. But I do also take the point that Patrick Harvey makes, that uh, the definition of consent is still problematic, and I think there are still knots in the bill as it stands that need to be, that need to be untied. Can I come back on one point about Sewell, Mr Chairman, and, that, um, and just to explain why I think the amendments published last week are compatible with the devolution settlement, whereas the original Clause 11 was not. And it is because what the amendments do is they essentially copy and paste Sewell. Now, Sewell is a rule um, that has been um, a core part of our devolution settlement since its inception in the late 1990s. And it says, of course, that Westminster will not normally leg legislate on matters that are devolved without the devolved administrations, sorry, without the devolved parliaments consent. And that's what the uh, convention uh, says. And it's a convention which is now not just an ordinary constitutional convention, it's an extraordinary constitutional convention because it is recognized, as Patrick Harvey said, uh, in statute in the Scotland Act 2016, um, uh, pursuant to a recommendation of the Smith Commission. So it's a, uh, a, co a constitutional convention given recognition uh, in primary legislation. And, and, and that rule that Parliament, the Westminster, will not normally legislate on devolved matters without, in Scotland's case, our consent uh, as MSPs, um, is exactly the basis of the amendment that was published last week, that um, uh, powers will not normally be taken into the holding pattern under the revised Clause 11 without the consent uh, of the Scottish Parliament, or as the case may be, Welsh Assembly or uh, even Northern Ireland Assembly. Um, and the, the, the searching for um, a, a power which is greater than that, which goes from, uh, in your words, Mr Chairman, normally to never, is to move from uh, the spirit of devolution, which is intergovernmental cooperation, to something which is quite different, which is giving devolved administrations vetoes on powers, which doesn't happen. There are, you know, the, the Scotland Acts are not full of veto powers. They are full of requirements on ministers of all colours and in all governments to cooperate with one another. And that's what the revised Clause 11 does. That's why, in my view, it's good enough for the Welsh government, and it's disappointing that it's not good enough yet uh, for the Scottish government, or at least not good enough yet for key members of the Scottish government, although if you look at the papers in Scotland yesterday, you'll see that there are some significant differences between key players uh, in Nicola Sturgeon's cabinet on this issue, it seems to me. Um, Mr Harvey again. Thank you. Uh, it, it's a source of great frustration that there's actually a lot of common ground, even though <coughs> we disagree very fundamentally on some specific issues here. Adam Tompkins is absolutely right that intergovernmental, and I would say interparliamentary cooperation should be the norm and is achievable. Uh, since I've been a member of the Scottish Parliament, 
that has taken place on a whole range of different issues. Mm. Uh, it, during my first session, I was involved uh, with charity law reform, both parliaments conducting charity law reform at roughly the same time, coordinating their action, consulting on some of the same questions, uh, legislating in a way that took account of each other's uh, intentions. The same thing has happened on planning. The same thing has happened uh, on uh, issues like marine environment. Uh, managing the marine environment was, was one of the examples that we took evidence on when uh, our committee uh, was, was hearing from witnesses on the EU withdrawal bill. This notion of common frameworks is entirely achievable uh, without an extra restriction on the legislative ability and freedom of the Scottish Parliament or the Scottish Government. It has happened before, it does happen frequently, uh, and it can only happen well in a respectful way uh, when neither side of that, that cooperative relationship uh, threatens a backstop and says, if you don't do it our way, We'll impose a solution. UK-wide common frameworks will be necessary. Everyone accepts that. They are achievable. Everyone believes that. But they are going to be best achieved in a spirit of respect and cooperation, not in a spirit of uh, intimidation and coercion. And, and that is the way that uh, even uh, this, this new amendment reads. How much we is will this say we have consent if you haven't given it. How much is this, in fact, an opportunity to resolve an ambiguity in the devolution settlement that was rather expertly fudged by the Sewell Convention. It very much is a, a huge opportunity, um, I think, because there's I mean in the last few years we haven't had, well since devolution started, we haven't had these kind of frameworks. And perhaps we should have more frameworks across the United Kingdom and agreeing a mechanism rather than just the ad hoc basis that we've had them up to now might actually be a good thing. And we could move towards that kind of federal structure that I would like, like to see, where the devolved institutions have a greater authority and say over the final decisions, rather than the ultimate sanction from Westminster being the final say. Can I move on? One sentence, Mr Leonard? Yeah, I mean, uh, th there's got to be negotiation. And there is another tension in the Scotland Act, if you like, which is around, on the one hand, the Schedule 5 uh, competences, and on the other hand, the, uh, the, the, the demand for the maintenance of a UK single market. And so uh, those 24 areas where there is still uh, uh, no resolution, uh, at least half of those, as I understand it, are, are around that tension. And so my, um, uh, my view is that the two governments need to keep working at getting a negotiated settlement around those competences so that this can then uh, be enacted as a piece of legislation. Because the people have voted uh, for Brexit, and I think uh, it's incumbent on politicians to work together to find a way through that. But I take it from your answer is that Mr Tonkins and Mr Leonard would accept the amendment, Clause 11 amendment as it stands, as a sufficient compromise, maybe plus some other things, but you would accept that in withdrawal bill, but Mr Rennie and Mr Harvey would not. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I think further compromise and agreement is required, yeah. Mr Harvey, that... you, you're certainly correct that I wouldn't accept it. I, I don't think I'd quite heard whether no. Richard was, uh, and I hope he's not accepting it. No, we, I mean, we wouldn't accept it because there are still more um, uh, aspects of this which need to be addressed. And I think it still fails prop properly to recognise the 98 Act and the, uh, the default position, which is about the powers uh, resting with the Scottish Parliament and not the UK Parliament. Quite right. And uh, does the Labour Party in London agree with that position? Um, I haven't spoken to the Labour Party of London as you characterise it, uh, <laughs> Mr Jenkins, but uh, I shall be doing so over the course of the next two days, rest assured. Anyway, you'll see that one or two of us have made speeches in the House of Commons that uh, share the view that uh, uh, more could have been done to promote trust and understanding around this subject at the outset, so it's not just Conservatives in, um, in the Scottish Parliament. Um, moving on, David Jones. Yes. Um, as you know, the uh, Scotland Act contains provisions which uh, empower the Secretary of State for Scotland uh, in, in certain cases to direct actions to be taken to ensure uh, the uh, c compatibility of any actions taken in, in Edinburgh with uh, the UK's international obligations. Um, I think those powers have n seldom, if ever, been used. Never. Um, to what extent do you think that there is a, a possibility that they may, be, that they may have to be used after Brexit? 
So this is the power in Section 58 of the Scotland Act, and there are um, equivalent provisions in the Government of Wales Act Correct. and in the Northern Ireland Act. So these are um, powers that, se that the Secretary of State has um, to require devolved administrations either to do something to comply with the UK's international treaty obligations or to cease to do something which is incompatible with the UK's international treaty obligations because an international war it is the United Kingdom and not the devolved administrations themselves who would be liable for any um, inadvertent or indeed deliberate breach of international law. That's, that's what we're talking about. Um, so the Section 58 power in, um, Scotland, in the Scotland Act has never been, to my knowledge, has never been used, never yet been used. And, and that is, I think, a reflection of how well, and, you know, in agreement with something that Patrick Harvey said a few minutes ago, that is a reflection, I think, of how well um, this element of, if you like, the informal side of the devolution settlement has hitherto worked uh, in the United Kingdom, which is to say that when there are um, uh, concerns uh, that UK ministers uh, have, that there may be um, the development um, uh, that could be uh, it, the, there may, may be a development with a devolved administration that could breach or risk breaching uh, international law. These things are sorted out and ironed out um, uh, in either at official level or, if necessary, at ministerial level in, co in correspondence and communication between governments. So we haven't needed to use, you know, the sharp end of the law. Um, we certainly haven't needed to go to court. We haven't needed to use anything uh, resembling a Section 58 power uh, in, in order to... Um, in order to uh, ensure that um, the United Kingdom isn't in breach of its treaty obligations. Look, I if would I may hope, interrupt I think, you, yeah. I mean, to what extent do you think that's going to be changed by the disappearance uh, of the European Union, the overarching presence of the I, European I, Union? I don't see any reason why it should be changed. Um, in, in, uh, but I do see that there is a, um, you know, uh, yet again, a, a, a revived urgency to ensure that our what I've called the informal side of devolution, that the, you know, the intergovernmental communications, the intergovernmental framework is fit for purpose. It is going to be stress tested by Brexit because the, you know, there is no doubt that the repatriation of powers from the European Union to the United Kingdom, wherever they sit in the United Kingdom, is going to require us all, um, whether we are in government or in opposition, whether we are in Westminster or in a devolved, or in a devolved uh, uh, legislature, um, to rethink the way in which the governments of these islands do business with one another, and indeed the way in which the parliaments of these islands do business with one another. That, with one another. that is going to be stress tested. But there is no reason, in my view, uh, to believe that the current informal arrangements can't continue to adapt and survive. Uh, the chairman talked earlier about constitutional fudge. Well, I'm all in favour of constitutional fudge if it avoids writing things down in an overly legalistic way, which might make uh, money for my good friends at the faculty. Um, and, but we'll see um, what I regard as political questions ending up in courts of law more frequently and not less frequently. And that's why I'm nervous about these kind of uh, calls for federalism that, uh, that we hear from, from, from time to time. So I, 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 I think that the fudge that we've got can continue to work um, in the post-Brexit environment, in my view, if the will is there on, on all sides to make it work. Um, we've got three quarters of an hour. Sorry. Uh, until the minister arrives. Um, and I think we owe it to the minister to see him on time. So the more you talk about this, means we're not going to get through the questions. So uh, d have any of you got anything to add to... I don't, I don't think, I don't think okay. that politics drives Section 58 to be used. I think um, we don't have governments in Scotland that tend to go rogue. Um, and, and therefore, I don't believe that it would be used in future. I think it's a backstop. Um, I think the debate is elsewhere. Um, I'll just add very briefly. I, I agree that there's no reason to presume that this would become more of a problem in, in the future. Uh, although Adam Tompkins is again right uh, on, on an issue where we'll agree that if indeed we are taken out of the European Union, and notwithstanding there are still many of us who are deeply opposed to that course of action, uh, it will inevitably change the relationship between governments and, and parliaments uh, within these islands, and we should be open to having that debate. I think the, the one thing I would add is that um, there are enforcement powers which are currently often needed to be used against both governments. I would give the example of air pollution. Both Scottish and UK governments have had to be taken through enforcement actions to ensure that the, the actions that are necessary to, to give people safe air to breathe are being taken. Uh, we've still not got to the point of, of fully implementing that, either in Scotland or the rest of the UK. And so there remains a question about at what level and through what institutions 
uh, will either government be capable uh, of having enforcement action taken uh, by uh, proceedings initiated by members of the public or, or those representing particular interest groups or, or issues? It's not just about the Scottish Parliament. Very briefly. Just very briefly. Um, Fudge suggests opaqueness. There needs to be transparency and openness, and that's why we have called for uh, joint ministerial committees of the future to be on a statutory footing and for their minutes to be available right, and we'll for people to, to understand yeah. uh, uh, what decisions have been taken on their behalf. You'll be getting an opportunity to talk about that. Uh, Rupert Hug. Actually, I think uh, people have already kind of dealt with this to some extent. Just the fact that since the uh, Scottish... The Scotland Act 1998, and even since Tony Blair originally said it would be like a parish council, these uh, sort of devolved uh, competencies and powers have incrementally grown. So it's a mystic meg question. How do you foresee this in the post-Brexit world if we do end up going out, which I hope, like yourself, we won't? And that's to everyone, really. Anything else to add? I'll be brief on that. Um, uh, um, the, I don't think the next chapter of our ongoing conversation about the future of devolution in the United Kingdom is going to be about more powers. I think that's what most of the last 20 years has been about. Um, I, I think that the, the next chapter is going to be about more cooperation, not more powers. It's not the self-rule bit of the equation that we need to focus on now, not, not, not the, the, the things which we as MSPs can do for ourselves um, uh, because they're devolved. It's how we integrate devolved government with reserved government um, it's the, the, the shared communication, it's the shared rule. Um, uh, that, that, that's the, that needs to be the focus now, not, not an endless search for, for more powers. I would say that since the creation of the Scottish Parliament, which most political parties campaign for, uh, even though the one political party that campaigned against it has uh, grown accustomed to it and has grown to support the existence of the Scottish Parliament, yet there has remained throughout all of that period uh, a sense that some have, uh, I think particularly some parts of the, the, the UK government uh, culture, seem to regard the Scottish Parliament almost as a department uh, of the UK government, as a part of the UK government, uh, which happens to be accountable to a, an elected chamber. Uh, I think that needs to change. If we're going to have a fully respectful relationship between the different institutions, we need also to respect the, the separate democratic legitimacy, uh, and that, I think, is still missing to some degree. Can I just say I agree Thomas. with that? I agree with that. Good. That was nice and quick. Brief. Anybody else? Good. Yeah, I, I think there's, it's not necessarily the powers, the transfer of the powers, that's the big debate. I think it's the cooperation between the different parts of the United Kingdom that's the big debate, and the reform of the UK institutions, whether it's the House of Lords or, or other um, arrangements. But that's what needs to change. The Scottish bit, actually, I think, has progressed very well. You could argue about more, some more tax powers in some areas and some other um, legislative powers as well. But by and large, I think that's relatively mature and should be allowed to develop. It's the cooperation, it's the core decision making across the United Kingdom that needs to change. Rupert. Yeah, in fact, that's what I wanted to ask about next. Uh, Richard Leonard, you said that there should be a statutory footing. We've heard this a lot in our evidence. And also, when we went to Cardiff, where they let us in their parliament, I think you guys wouldn't allow us through your threshold. Anyway, oh, um, I don't, not you personally, but the statutes. Do do with that. It, 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 there is, um, at the moment, some, something of a, a little standoff between the mm. Scottish Parliament and the United Kingdom Parliament. We have capacity oh, wow. issues in our rooms. Unless we can provide reciprocal access, uh, we, should be allow each, we should be allowing each other others' committees to meet on our own premises. Yes, we should. Absolutely. And um, it's, some, it's work in progress. Okay. Mm. But I hope that... Uh, Hopefully next time we can yeah. <laughs> do it there. But, yeah, um, so intergovernmental relations going on a statutory footing, uh, what principles should underpin these relationships? Well, I think that there ought to be... Um, there should be a kind of parity of esteem. The, uh, the situation is we are going from a model where you had a European Commission or still have a European Commission uh, usually taking the initiative, uh, uh, subject to scrutiny by a European Parliament, uh, which is then uh, agreed upon or not through a qualified majority voting or unanimity in some areas of policy by a Council of Ministers, which is then subject to a European Court of Justice to, uh, to oversee 
and, uh, and, and, and we don't have any of that apparatus here really. So I think, I think we need to consider, and that's obviously a, a multinational uh, uh, organisation, but I do think we need to consider within the UK what then, what then works. And I think, you know, often in Scotland we've seen things almost on a bilateral basis. I think we need to look at things on a multilateral basis uh, for the future. And, um, and, and I think, you know, Willie has mentioned it, and I think you took evidence in Wales where people spoke about uh, the exploration of a qualified majority, uh, a qualified majority voting kind of model. Uh, and, and I think that's right. And I think, it, it's, it, in my view, it's got to be seen as... Uh, part of a wider reform agenda for uh, the, the di distribution of power inside the UK. And, uh, and I think that leads me, uh, Adam disagrees, but it leads me uh, to a consideration of a federal model. It leads me to a consideration of the reform of the House of Lords and, and, and some kind of uh, uh, national, regionally elected Senate type of model in its place uh, could help to address some of these issues as well as the joint ministerial working model uh, that we've spoken about. Um, just to, to briefly add, if there, if there are going to have to be, and there may have to be, significant powers that are jointly exercised by ministers uh, of multiple governments uh, throughout the UK, then there also needs to be equally powerful inter-parliamentary scrutiny uh, mechanisms. Those are, are absent. Uh, and there are, there, are, there are significant formal ways that we can do that through, through joint meetings, which uh, haven't happened very much. Uh, there's been some issues with it. Different committees have had video conference meetings and so on, but it's not quite the same as jointly sharing a scrutiny role. Uh, and I think, uh, uh, I was about to say, call you convener, but uh, is it chairman? Um, I'd be honoured to be called convener. The, uh, co in, in that case, convener, um, <laughs> the, the, the little symbolic matters, like whether a committee of one parliament can meet in the other's building, do matter. Uh, as did the, uh, we were just discussing this before the, the meeting began, uh, the, the question of security passes. The original intention when the Scottish Parliament was created was that they would be reciprocally valid and, and recognised between the parliaments. Uh, and I think the Westminster authorities were reluctant to, to, to proceed with, with that. These little symbolic things could do a lot to reinforce the fact uh, that we are and always will be, regardless of our constitutional relationship, in some form of relationship and, and communication between us. Thank you for that. I mean, I just say it's, we could make a safe assumption that the House of Lords is going to be an intractable issue for some time. What should we be doing in the meantime? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Adam, Adam Tonkins. Can, can, can I come on, on the question of, of whether intergovernmental relations should be placed on a statutory footing or not, which I think was part of your, your, it was your question. It's a kind of assumption. I think it, the uh, question was meant to be what are the principles and what are the mechanisms if we yeah. do go ahead with all well, this? Uh, I mean, I'm not too bothered about whether it's on a statutory footing or not. I am much more bothered about whether it works. Um, uh, and, um, you know, you could have an informal system of intergovernmental relations which has no recognition in the statute at, at all, which works brilliantly. You could have a very formal or very over, overly formalised um, uh, legislative suite of powers and obligations with regard to intergovernmental relations that don't work at all. And it seems to me that what matters is whether it works or not, not and whether it's on a statutory footing or not. And, uh, and the, challenge, I think, the challenge that I think Brexit is going to pose to this. It's, it was already a challenge that was being posed, but Brexit, I think, brings it to the fore uh, even more because of the nature of some of the um, uh, powers which are being re repatriated from the European Union, um, is that so far there has, um, and I very strongly agree with what Patrick Harvey had to say about Whitehall, so far there has been a complete failure to recognise in Whitehall that effective intergovernmental uh, relations will need to include co-decision will need to include some mechanism by which policy decisions are made jointly between different administrations. That won't always be easy because it will often be the case that different administrations have different political preferences in different parts of the United Kingdom. And what we need to do um, is to find a, me a mechanism, um, whether it's on a statutory footing or not doesn't matter, but what we need to find is an effective mechanism of enabling that co-decision, that joint decision-making, that joint policy-making to work. Um, and then, again, very strongly in agreement with what Patrick Harvey had to say. Had this to say is about getting this. uncomfortable. There needs to be, uh, there needs to be, um, you know, robust interparliamentary scrutiny of that um, joint decision-making process. Uh, Richard said that the problem with fudge is that it's, it lacks transparency. It's opaque, and, and, and he's absolutely right about that. Um, we, we do we do need to think very carefully about how we um, open up 
um, the structure of intergovernmental relations to effective parliamentary scrutiny. Now, in the Scottish Parliament, we have two rules, which, as I understand, you don't yet have in Westminster. Those rules aren't always adhered to in the Scottish Parliament, but they are there. One rule is that um, uh, the relevant committee of the Scottish Parliament is entitled to see the agenda of any joint ministerial meeting before that meeting takes place, preferably in time for us to be able to call that minister into account and say, what do you plan to talk about uh, when you go down there, or what do you plan to talk about when the Westminster um, uh, minister comes uh, to visit you? And uh, we are entitled to see the minutes of those meetings as soon as possible. Now, that doesn't always happen. And, for example, the most recent meeting of the Joint Ministerial Working Group on Welfare, which is a bilateral between the DWP and the Scottish Government, we haven't seen the minutes of the most recent meeting because, as I understand it, there is a disagreement about what SNP ministers said um, at, at that meeting. But we don't, so the, the rules are not always uh, honoured, as I would like them to be as an opposition uh, MSP, but they are there. And that is at least a start of a way in which you can try and secure um, some kind of effective parliamentary scrutiny um, of what ministers talk about behind closed doors in these uh, various formats and meetings. Interesting. Others will get a chance to come in. Rupa? Um, yeah. Would yeah. you have any? Do you want to have it on a proper Yeah, no, I, it's, it's fine. I mean, this, the processes work when the spotlight is on, mm. but as soon as the spotlight's somewhere else, it's then that's when it's prone to break down. And it won't matter as much politically at that point. So we've had, for the first few years, the Scottish Parliament wanted to make it work. Everybody wanted it to succeed. So the cooperation and the consent and that all worked. And then we had the independence referendum and everybody was tiptoeing around all that issue to make... So there was an interest in making it work. If independence goes off the agenda, which I hope it does, then there's a, there is a potential for us just to slip and us not to actually consider these so issues so in the terms of the issue. Go faster, yeah. And should there be, I think Adam's already said yes, <laughs> inter-parliamentary scrutiny of these intergovernmental relations, how should those bodies look like? What would they, yeah, consist of? Or how would they be constituted? Well, well I think there's got to be, uh, and I think... The truth is the detail of that has still got to be worked through because it needs to be something which is sufficiently fleet of foot uh, that uh, it's, it's workable, um, but, but it needs to, uh, because there's an important role um, to hold to account uh, those multilateral discussions that will be, I hope, will be taking place. So um, precisely how that's composed um, is, is certainly sitting here today. It's difficult for me to, um, uh, to describe, but I think... The, the intent, the principle has got to be there that there needs to be a parliamentary scrutiny of any uh, ministerial decision making uh, in the future. Yeah, I mean, we, tur we turn back really to, to where we began the discussion with the, the amendments to the EU withdrawal bill. If a future mechanism is going to fully respect the principle of, of parliamentary consent, then decisions which are jointly made by ministers in some kind of intergovernmental arrangement uh, and which require parliamentary consent, clearly require the consent of all the relevant parliaments, uh, not only one of them. So uh, that, the, the, the approach to how that's achieved, how the debate reaches the point where mutual consent can be given, uh, is about communication and understanding and listening, but ultimately both parliaments or all parliaments and assemblies, if, if that's the case, need to be in a position to say yes or say no and be respected. Excellent. Um, Kelvin Hopkins, we are actually getting ahead. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, um, it, uh, you've already given quite a comprehensive comments on the kind of question I'm going to ask. But before that, uh, um, this committee ran an online public forum to canvas public opinion in advance of this session uh, and found that 98% of respondents indicated that the UK and Scottish governments and parliaments do not work successfully together, with only 0.1% indicating that they work well together. That's a pretty devastating result, I think. Um, but have you got anything to add to what you've been saying about uh, how we can build trust and mutual respect? Well, I think on the, Bre on the Brexit side, it is happening. Um, it's beginning to happen. I mean, there is a forum uh, in which the chairman and I have met uh, um, on, on several occasions now called, I think, the Interparliamentary Forum on Brexit. I've probably got its name wrong. Um, but it's an informal coming together of the conveners, deputy conveners, chairs of um, committees in the Scottish Parliament, Welsh Assembly, uh, House of Commons and House of Lords to, discuss, to just to exchange notes um, and exchange ideas about um, the way in which um, our various uh, legislative houses are seeking to hold ministers to account for the way in which they are um, uh, trying to deliver um, the, you know, uh, the, 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 Brexit, the Brexit process. And that, 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 I, 
the chairman has welcomed that. I, I have welcomed it, as has Bruce Crawford, who's the convener of the committee on which Patrick and I both uh, serve. Um, uh, and I think that's a very useful start. But you know, if there are rules in either the House of Commons or in the Scottish Parliament that somehow prevent Commons committees from meeting in the Scottish Parliament estate or vice versa, and certainly that it's not straightforward um, getting into the Westminster Parliament if you've only got a Scottish Parliament pass, then these are the sorts of things that could very easily, it seems to me, be, 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 be sorted out on a logistical basis. And the more we, you know, the easier we make it for ourselves to do business with each other, the more likely we are to do business with each other. We'll probably find that we quite like each other, and we've got quite a lot in common, and we quite like doing business with each other, and we'll do more. Mm. I, I, I don't know how um, big the sample size was to arrive at that um, to arrive at that 98% vote, um, and uh, and the, the truth of the matter is that uh, I think the, it was the, um, 1,300 the, respondents. Okay, okay, yeah. So they were sample so size, yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, but I suspect it's um, it's a reflection of the um, of the narrative in Scottish politics at the moment, which is. Um, it, which is um, largely caricatured by uh, the UK government um, doing things to us, um, when I would always qualify it by saying it's a Conservative government which is taking these decisions. And, uh, but that's not often how it's uh, caricatured. I, I, I think that even, even when the same party was, um, was at least sharing power in the Scottish Parliament uh, and in power at a UK level, there were still tensions then. And uh, whilst there were, you know, there were um, uh, discussions which took place, and it's probably e easier within the context of being in uh, one party or one party being, as I say, sharing power on, in one institution and, and being in power in the other, um, uh, there, were still, um, there were still some difficulties around that. But I don't think at that point the public perception would be a 98% sense that the Parliament or the governments do not work uh, together cooperatively. And, and, and I suppose that sets as a challenge, doesn't it? If there is broad agreement uh, that, uh, that that 98% dissatisfaction rate or however it's, uh, however it's relayed uh, means that there's an awful lot of uh, um, um, yardage, meterage that we can gain uh, to pull that back because it, because it clearly um, it makes more sense for governments on the shared island to be cooperating. The well, thing is complicated, I think, if you're suggesting that it by different political parties in, in power in different places, uh, the divisions between political parties everywhere, the divisions within political parties, um, which, is, which is equally complex, I think, um, and it, it's all coloured by views on the EU, views on independence, and so on. So. It's not just an academic mm. discussion between uh, professors. I mean, can I, um, yes. uh, just, uh, I, I, I think you're, you're right that uh, if there's going to be a stable constitutional relationship between Scotland and the rest of the UK, the UK, albeit that that issue will. It has to be a, a relationship. That closeness between uh, different administrations and when there is a great deal of political distance between the, uh, the administrations, when the relationships are warm and friendly and when they're, they're less so. I wouldn't rule out the possibility that your, uh, your, your poll or your, your survey result uh, more reflects the fact that disagreements and arguments get more coverage. Um, and I would, I would uh, mention again the issue of uh, marine planning, marine spatial planning, and marine environment. Complex multi-layered area of legislation and regulation. It took years to through both parliaments, many competing interest groups around access uh, and just, you know, it, it is a, a good example of how co and has taken place well uh, with the story that loggerheads between the UK and the like that, or repair some of the damage that's been done over this process is if the Scottish and Welsh Government were actually to, to, to win the day in an argument that the UK Government didn't agree with, um, and they were quite clearly unhappy about that outcome, that actually might just show that the institutions and the frameworks of the United Kingdom actually do reflect the diversity that's within the United Kingdom. Now, I don't know what that subject would be. It might be this one. It might be another issue. But actually, on occasion, just the small guy winning might actually just repair some of the damage 
that's been done as a result of this whole Brexit process, which I think Adam would agree has been cack-handed um, and it's been crass in its management um, because it's, it's been imposed. There was little discussion. Getting the dialogue working effectively has been hopeless. Um, so actually, it might, it might, something like that might restore some of the damage that's been done. Um, in our, we've done three reports, if I'm correct, under, in, uh, on interinstitutional relations. Um, and we've come up with a number of suggestions, and I'd be interested in your reaction to some of them. One is, as we've discussed, putting JMC onto a statutory footing. Um, uh, another was that there should be somewhere less political to discuss the distribution of powers and the formation of joint frameworks, m something more like the Kalman Commission, uh, where these things were looked at sort of more forensically and dispassionately and expertly. Uh, what do you think of the suggestion that there should be a sort of standing advisory commission on, uh, on shared powers? I think the second one is always political. I think it's going to be difficult to make it in a more neutral, non-political environment. I think the first one's a very good idea. It's something that we've supported for some time. We did through the, the Smith Commission process. Michael Moore was a, a strong advocate of, of making the GMCs a much more central part of our intergovernment and interparliamentary arrangements. So um, we are very much in support of that. But the second one, it might be worth doing it. Um, it might make it more neutral, might make it much safer and much more professional. But I think the idea that it wouldn't be political, I think, is stretching Okay, well, I'll, I'll remove it. that suggestion that it's not going to be political, but to, oh, yes, to, to, yeah. to have more paper, more discussion, uh, more process around these issues on a permanent basis, rather than just relying on the government making a proposal uh, and then everybody reacting to it. Anybody else? I, I think I'm inclined to agree with Willie about both, both elements of that, um, at least to some measure. I mean, as I said before, I don't think it matters whether JMC is on a strategy footing or not. I think what matters is whether it works. And one of the things that would make it work is more transparency around the process, yeah, more regularity around the I process. Think it's very interesting ideas um, you've, you've uh, given us. And, and all of that. Do we need a standing committee on powers and where powers lie? No, I don't think so. Um, but do we need to do some um, pretty quick learning? from other countries around the world or other countries in Europe where there is multi-layered government, whether federal formally or not, about how governments communicate with one another and cooperate with one another, with one another in the delivery, in the design and delivery of shared policy um, responsibility. Yes, we do. Because as I said uh, in an earlier answer, all of our conversation about devolution in the last 20 years has been about powers. And now it needs to not be about powers. It now yeah. needs to be about cooperation and how we deliver that. Um, and Patrick Harvey, you want to add something? Uh, well, just to say that I, I don't think any of us should pretend that we have all the answers to this question. I think, it, I think everyone is, is slightly feeling their way through this, this process at the moment. Uh, I, I would, um, just in relation to the way that you framed the question, you, you made a, a reference, I think, to the Kalman Commission. Uh, and I think that would not be a good model because it was explicitly established uh, with a, an intent to exclude uh, two of the political parties in the Scottish Parliament. It was explicitly oh, right. designed uh, to be uh, a, 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 a discussion which excluded the possibility of independence even being considered. Uh, now, if, if you're doing that, then clearly uh, the, the political parties, which were at the time the largest and smallest in the Scottish Parliament, could not sign up to that remit. Uh, and the, there seemed to be no willingness uh, on the part of the parties uh, that initiated that process, and it was initiated by political parties. Uh, there seemed to be no willingness to, to be flexible about that remit and, and to ensure that it could be the broadest possible discussion. And it would need to be the broadest possible right. discussion, okay. recognising right. those fundamental differences. So it would have to be a common plus plus to satisfy you. Well, well the, the only time that all five political parties in Scotland have sat around the table together to talk about Scotland's constitutional future um, is the Smith Commission. And there is no member of the Smith Commission who wants to do that again. <laughs> <laughs> Largely because it was given a, an absurdly complex job on a breakneck timescale. Yeah. Uh, I don't think any of us would be looking for kind of emergency crash courses of, of, of that kind in the future. 
Mr Leonard. JMC on a statutory footing and learn some international lessons. I mean, I met with the, um, the, Swedish, uh, the Swiss ambassador last week, and of course they are outside the EU. They, uh, have, a, they have mechanisms in place to make sure that there is alignment uh, with, uh, with uh, decisions uh, taken in the EU around the single market so that they can uh, retain access to it. And so I think there are, I'm not saying uh, for a minute that we should simply uh, transplant the, the Swiss model here, but I think we need to learn from those international experiences of life beyond membership of the EU and, and fashion it in a way which suits our circumstances. And our circumstances very much now include uh, the devolved parliaments and assemblies of the United Kingdom. Um, and and uh, we looked at how we can develop the Interparliamentary Forum on Brexit. Uh, at the moment, there is very little that happens formally, and we've suggested that there should be some kind of um, Interparliamentary Council of the United Kingdom uh, that would meet regularly, uh, r rather like, rather modelled on the Council of Europe, um, and scrutinise the intergovernmental process. What do you think of that idea? It, it, you, you, you need to make sure that it's seen as a body that actually has influence over the process. And there's a danger you could set up bodies that are actually not that influential, and with people that are not that influential, they don't carry the weight and the authority. So it needs to be sh you need to be sure that you send people that are sufficiently senior, and because and they will, those senior people would only go to it if it did have that authority. So setting up a, a whole range of bodies, actually more is not necessarily better. Making sure they've got authority is probably the way to do it. Anybody else? I think I much prefer the abolition of the House of Lords. OK, well, um, again, I, I think it's a safe assumption that's not going to happen for a long time. Um, so can, can, I, can I just comment that one of the problems with commissions and any kind of body set up in British Isles is that the control is always at the centre, and Prime Ministers in particular make sure they've got their place persons on those committees to make sure they get the right result. That's what's really happened. And in some areas, it's absolutely vital to do that. Northern Ireland the balance between the, the, the two sides, if you like, in Northern Ireland, was always most care, carefully um, scrutinised and, and arranged, especially the Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland Housing Commission back 40 years ago, whenever, um, to make sure that housing was fairly allocated. That had to have the right political balance. And if there was, one, if there was a majority for, we should say, the Republican side rather than, rather than the Unionist side, that would have caused problems, I think, in Northern Ireland. So a one-seat majority for unionism uh, that was okay, um, and uh, it, it, it sort of worked. Yeah. But prime ministers classically uh, control appointments, and, uh, and the most extreme example perhaps was Tony Blair, who made sure that he had people on certain bodies and certain commissions, make sure that he stopped. Specifically, House of Lords reform, I like uh, Richard Lennon was an abolitionist, a unicameralist, and uh, I asked why it was, that was not one of the options considered. And I was just told that was not on the agenda. Basically, shut up. And your question is? My question is, you know, are these going to be independent bodies, or are they actually in our system going to be fixed? I, th I think the more we can talk about substance rather than process, the easier it will be for the process to sort itself out. So let me give you an example of what I mean. At the moment, um, we are part way through um, what is the biggest single transfer of powers from Whitehall to the Scottish Government, and that's, of course, in the, in the field of Social Security. Now, I, I also sit on the Social Security Committee in the Scottish Parliament, um, and you know, uh, we need to talk um, with the uh, Work and Pensions Committee in the House of Commons um, to find out um, you know, how DWP are handling the transfer of powers and how the Scottish Government are handling the transfer of powers and how they're handling the transfer of information about the transfer of those powers to the, to the Scottish Parliament and to the House of Commons, and we do. And we don't worry too much about the process because we've got a specific you know, policy issue that we need to address sub substantively. And, and I think that's the level at which this should work post-Brexit too. So you know, if it turns out that there is a significant uh, argument between uh, different uh, governments at different levels or different governments of political colours about agricultural subsidy or about food labelling, um, then the relevant committees of the House of Commons and the devolved legislatures sh can and should get together to jointly hold those ministers to account for what they're doing uh, in those meetings. Um, can I just also um, ask your reaction? We are doing one or two housekeeping things in committees. Uh, we are 
um, arranging uh, for committees, if I'm correct, to be able to accept a guest, uh, and that guest could be a member of a committee from a devolved parliament into the committee for the cross-examination of a minister or the cross-examination of a key witness. Um, uh, we think this is quite a, it would be quite a significant development. Um, do you think the Scottish Parliament would consider a reciprocal arrangement along these lines? I, I don't know whether it would, but I, I think I, for myself, think that it should. Um, I mean, I, I think the, the more we can integrate um, each other in our work of holding governments to account for the, for, for the work that they do, um, uh, in terms of you know, intergovernmental decision making and intergovernmental uh, um, uh, cooperation that happens in, in, in the United Kingdom, the, the, the more we can do to help ourselves undertake that task robustly, the better our democracy will be. Um, we have the advantage that any select committee can meet anywhere it wants. I don't think you have the same freedom uh, in the Scottish Parliament. I think your select committees have to meet uh, on the premises or at least in Scotland. I, I, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, we would very much like to welcome uh, formal meetings of Scottish committees at Westminster uh, and maybe even joint meetings between reciprocal committees. Um, is this something that we could, do you think we can fruitfully discuss? I think all of these, these options should certainly be explored. Um, yeah, um, I'm a, also a member of the, the Procedures uh, Committee in the, in the Scottish Parliament, and so if, if your committee wanted to, to write to either the Presiding Officer or the Procedures Committee to explore those issues, I, I expect there'd be uh, some openness to them. I, I do think, though, that um, there, are, there are other aspects that go beyond uh, parliamentary rules. Many devolved <coughs> parliamentary committees, I th certainly in, in Scotland, I suspect elsewhere, have found it very difficult, very difficult, uh, to get UK ministers to come and give evidence. And there will always be UK decisions which impact on wholly devolved areas. Mm -hmm. Housing, for example, has been fully devolved since the creation of the Scottish Parliament. Uh, but if, if the rules on housing benefit change, uh, which obviously are, are held at a UK level, or, or largely have been, uh, that clearly is going to have an impact on Scottish housing policy. So you need to be able to take evidence from and and hold to account at some level for their impact on devolved issues, UK ministers as well. That's been profoundly difficult. And I'd very much like to re-emphasise the, the point. Personally, I would like reciprocal access through exchange of passes to each other's premises. I think that would be sensible. Can I ask, finally, um, in our previous session, Professor Michael Keating told us that there should be a set of principles, we should develop a set of principles underpinning uh, future UK go uh, devolved government relations. Um, what, what do you think that set of principles would look like? Well, I, I, I think um, the principles need to um, include transparency. Uh, they need to include um, an end to a very often what's seen as a very kind of London-centric view. Um, and you feel this in England too, you know. <laughs> And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and which is why I think the idea of, of putting things on a statutory footing makes, makes so much sense, um, uh, because I do actually also think that that would work. Um, so so the, the, the principle of transparency, of, of, um, a, of a kind of an equality of a position, how you then resolve that within the context of England, I think, is a, is a, is a big question, because does that look like England, Wales, Northern Ireland and Scotland, or does it look like uh, uh, England subdivided in some way, uh, in, in, a, in a method yet to be determined and agreed upon, and in the end that's for the people of England to, uh, to decide upon. So I, I, I think that there are, um, th th but there has got to be, at the end of it, um, some kind of equality of esteem and equality of, uh, a greater equalisation of power, I think, as well. A last word, anybody? I'm not sure there would be a huge amount of value in writing down a set of principles as a wish list uh, if, in fact, uh, they're not being uh, adhered to. I think there's a huge amount of work, and it will take a long time to improve intergovernmental relationships and, and to improve interparliamentary mechanisms as well. If that is done, if that hard graft is done, and I suspect it will have to be after uh, the, the profoundly divisive uh, issue of Brexit is resolved one way or the other, uh, if that is done, then it may be possible that a set of principles can emerge as an accurate description of what is happening rather than as a wish list. I think, I think trust, trust, respect 
I think, a learning culture of recognising that different parts of the United Kingdom can do things and they can do things well. It doesn't have to necessarily be created by Westminster in order to be effective. Openness and I think equality is, is another principle that should be regarded too. Um, and as long as the Westminster continues to represent England as well as the United Kingdom, it will, there will be an advantage of UK Parliament, sorry, Scottish parliamentarians or Welsh Assembly members going on to UK committees to ask about relevant issues. Whether it's the other way around, you could argue in the area of international development where we've done more on, there might be an advantage of having some reciprocal ag agreement. Um, but I don't think there would be a great advantage in having UK parliamentarians scrutinising Scottish health ministers about the Scottish NHS uh, because it's wholly devolved. So I think there's a, that we need to clarify the UK constitution before you could really have a truly reciprocal arrangement uh, going forward. I'm a bit more sceptical about this, Mr Chairman. I, mean, I don't think that there is such a list of principles in the United States or in Canada or, um, so far as I know, even in, in Switzerland, certainly not in Germany, um, which are all you know, very functioning um, and mature federal uh, jurisdictions. I think what there is a much more significant need for is a change of culture and understanding in Whitehall that this is not a unitary state. It is a multi-government state. Um, it is a, um, a multinational state, um, uh, and that leaving the European Union does not mean in any way that we revert to the Constitution of 1972, which is the year we joined. We are leaving the European Union in a constitutional environment which is very different indeed from that which um, pertained in the early 1970s. And if that could be understood, I, don't, I think it is understood in Westminster, I think it isn't always understood in Whitehall. And if, we could, if, if I could have one single wish out of this, it would be that that change of culture could happen sooner rather than later in Whitehall. I think that would avoid a lot of the problems that we've encountered since uh, June 16. Well, thank you very much. And if, with the permission of your colleagues, that, if that can be the last word, um, I think it's been a, a, a smashing session and given us plenty to think about and some good ideas for some further recommendations to make. Uh, we're very grateful to you. Uh, the committee will adjourn for five minutes. The minister is here, and we will uh, resume at 11.30 precisely. Thank you. Thanks very order, much. order.
Okay. Order, order, and welcome to this final session this morning in Edinburgh of the Public Affairs and Constitutional Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee of the House of Commons from London. Uh, um, and uh, we're very pleased to have our final witness in front of us. Uh, witnesses, I should say. Uh, please could you identify yourselves for the record. Um, Mike Russell, I'm the Minister for UK Negotiation and Scotland's Place in Europe, which is a long way of saying the Brexit Minister. And I'm Ken Thompson, I'm Director General for Constitution and External Affairs, which is a long way of saying that I'm the senior official supporting Mr Russell on Brexit. Thank you. So, um, just a sort of scene setter um, set of questions, really. How often does the First Minister speak to the Prime Minister? I think in the last year, um, on three occasions, uh, she's met with the, 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 the Prime Minister. I think it is uh, the frequency varies. Um, for example, the structure of the JMC process, which we will go into, no doubt at some stage, through JMC plenary, would mean that they met more often if there were the plenaries took place more often. Uh, if the Prime Minister attended, for example, the, the British Irish Council, which the Taoiseach attends and the First Minister attends and the First Minister of Wales attends, then there would obviously be other occasions. But the JMC plenary, I think I'm right in saying from the independence referendum in September 2014, until the Downing Street meeting in October 2016 had not actually uh, been in session. So n probably infrequently would be the answer. And um, how does it compare to previous Prime Ministers? I, I don't think it has been very much more frequent. Um, clearly when uh, Gordon Brown was Prime Minister uh, with a Scottish constituency, the opportunity oh, might have been greater. I don't think it's been that regular. And it is the linchpin of it is the JMC plenary, which gives the opportunity for it to happen. Um, and what about your, um, the regularity of your conversations with Damien Green and now David Liddington? When the JMC was altered, the new part of the structure was established, the JMC European Negotiations, which came out of the Downing Street meeting in October 2016. The intention was that the JMC EN would meet on a monthly basis. It met in November, December, January and February and then didn't meet again until October. Um, I met David Davis between those meetings as well uh, to discuss details of, of what was taking place. There was, however, the, the UK general election of June uh, 2017 interrupted the process somewhat. But, for example, I did see David again very quickly after that election uh, to talk about the withdrawal bill. And uh, the conversations with Damien Green and with David Liddington have tended to take over the role uh, in terms of formalising the, 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 the dealing with the devolved administrations have been frequent uh, telephone conversations and face-to-face -face meetings and the JMC uh, EN. I mean, in the last month, I've spoken to... I've met with... Um, uh, David Liddington, I think, twice, and I've certainly spoken to him on the phone twice. So those are more frequent, uh, and the discussions are probably more intense. And that was the same with Damien Green, who I, I thought very highly of, and I thought was made a very strong contribution to that developing relationship. Also because, and no doubt we'll come into this, he, um, he also altered the nature of the JMC, which was significant. It hasn't gone far enough, but he made some significant changes. And so how would you characterise relations between? On an individual basis, I think they're perfectly um, uh, civilised and, and positive. There are very difficult issues to be dealt with. And we will come uh, to we, I'm sure we will. Uh, but a, on, a, on a personal basis, I can't complain about that. And they've been positive. And, 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 your, and with your uh, Welsh counterparts, um, how often do you speak to your Welsh counterparts? That has become very intense in the last... Uh, 18 months to two years because of the nature of the Brexit process, because uh, Mark Drakeford, who is handling this matter for the Welsh Government, and I obviously have many uh, issues in common, and particularly over the withdrawal bill and the continuity bills, it's been very regular. I would be speaking to Mark uh, usually on every 10 days, fortnight to 10 days. Uh, we've met at JMCs, we've met on other occasions, and we've met when we delivered speeches or papers at a variety of conferences. It's been pretty intense, and pretty intense with Northern Ireland until the Northern Irish uh, government ceased uh, to function. And, 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 and at official level, what kind of dialogue takes place? 
pretty Mr. constant. Thompson. I was going to ask Mr. Thompson yeah. if that's all right. Mm -hmm. um, it's pretty constant. <laughs> um, There's the, always a unanimity, unanimity of view in this question. You just gave him the line to take. <laughs> Uh, the, the various more formal groups that the Minister refers to um, have um, officials in support of them, so that just as there is a JMC, there is a JMCO uh, group, a group of officials, uh, and those people are in touch uh, very frequently and uh, in, in the run-up to the formal meeting, but also to, uh, to exchange um, information and um, keep in touch with each other from time to time. Um, and, and with your Welsh counterparts as well? Likewise, uh, the, the Welsh and Northern Irish still are rec uh, represented on those groups too. But how substantive are those discussions compared to the, the, the discussions with ministers, between ministers? Well, the, a lot of this is, um, is what's called in the civil service Sherpa work, the Sherpas being the people who take the ministers to the summits. Um, and so this would not, these would not be um, determinative meetings, but they are meetings at which we um, prepare the agendas, uh, prepare papers, ensure that to, the, the issues are... Uh, brought to a, a point or winnowed through in such a way that ministers can make the best use of their time. Um, yes, the Scottish Government has raised concerns with um, the UK Government in relation to the EU withdrawal bill. What's been your experience of consultation and engagement with the um, Westminster Government concerning the bill? It is a question of before and after the publication of the bill. The normal work that would be done on a bill that would require an element of legislative consent, and clearly this bill would, uh, would be to have very close liaison between officials as the bill is being drafted so that any difficulties can be ironed out. That didn't take place. Um, I uh, discussed the bill in outline at one of the JMCENs uh, with... Um, Ben Gummer, who was then responsible for the, the bill. Um, there was then a hiatus. I raised the bill at the JMC plenary in Cardiff in January 2017 with the Prime Minister directly, and we were told that we would see the bill at some stage. Then the election intervened, and we were shown the bill at the very end of June, or perhaps the beginning of, the very beginning of July, I'd have to check the date, um, between officials, um, with it due to be published within a fortnight. In other words, it was finished. Uh, we therefore had, we had great concerns with the bill at that stage, and indeed I went to, to London to see David Davis about the bill on the 3rd of July to explain that we couldn't, uh, we couldn't accept the bill in its current form. And since then, there has been very substantial engagement on it. It has been the, 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 at the centre of discussion at the JMC uh, ENs, which were held in October and in December and in February and in March. Uh, it was also the subject of bilateral meetings, or myself, John Swinney, um, uh, uh, David Liddington and uh, uh, David Mundell, and before that, uh, Damien Green and David Mundell. Um, and it's also been the subject of discussions with the Welsh Government. Um, we still do not have a resolution of the central issue around that bill, as you will know, although we have made substantial progress on some of the other issues uh, surrounding the bill. So initially in January, then the election. Sorry, how long was it actually th that you had prior sight of the bill before it was published? Uh, a fortnight. Uh, and the bill weeks. was finished. I mean, it wasn't in drafting, draft form. It was finished. We okay, were so shown... it wasn't even a draft for comment no, that no. civil we, servants would we have saw some input no, into? Uh, the chair raised the, the issue of, of, of the nature of the debate, the discussions between, uh, in JMC and between ministers, between officials. I think it's important to to focus on that as much as the number of those meetings. I mean, at, at many JMC meetings, there would be a, a remark made by one minister or another that there had been 20 meetings of officials. The actual quality of those meetings varied quite substantially, and there was a, a frustration that we did not know, and, and there's still a frustration, that we don't know what either the policy is or the thinking leading to the policy, and that, re that applies to every area. Um, migration is an interesting issue in that, that we've never had a substantive informed discussion about migration in terms of the options which the UK government is considering, for example, for its white paper, a matter I raised with Brandon Lewis when he came to the JMCEN, I think, in December last year, uh, because we really needed to know, as these matters were considered, what the UK government was considering in those areas, because we would want to respond to that. Uh, and that's really been the problem. It's been difficult to get the information is required to lead to a meaningful discussion, which I, I think Ken would probably be able to comment on too. Just to, to um, add to that point briefly, um, usually in order for the Seoul Convention to work, if the UK government is contemplating 
primary legislation in a, a, which impacts on a default area, the, the, the way that the civil convention works assumes that the legislation will be seen in draft and worked through over usually a period of many months. So that uh, by the time um, the bill is published, it's possible for the, uh, well, by then the, the governments would have agreed and the Scottish ministers would be in a position to recommend consent to the bill. But that's not what's happened in this case. And you said, Mike Russell, you did raise some red flags. What was the reaction? Well, in so it's presented as a fait accompli, you're kept in the dark. You when I, I remember the JMCE and I raised this with Ben Gummer and I suggested Ben came to Scotland and we sat down and talked about this and it seemed a good idea, but it didn't actually happen. When I raised it with the Prime Minister, I, I, we all agreed, I think, in the JMC plenary that we needed to see the draft bill and we needed to see the timetable for the bill. That didn't happen. So when we saw the bill, there was then, you know, an, an election intervened and, and elections do intervene, but when the election intervened, and there was obviously not going to be an exchange of information and wasn't even between officials, and so we then, after the election, started to say very quickly, we need to see this, this document. There's, a le I think, a letter from myself and, and Mark Drakeford laying out some issues for David Davis for the future after the election, um, but we didn't see it until... I think it was the last day of June, um, and I think it was due to be published in the first fortnight of July, and I think its publication was put off. If, if I remember correctly, I think it was published on the 18th of July. But it was, it was in finished form. There was no draft discussions, um, and that, that is a problem. Moving on. Uh, Calvin Hopkins. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, the Scottish Parliament's passed a continuity bill um, what is the purpose of the bill and why did the Scottish Government think it necessary? A, the purpose of the bill is to make sure that there is no um, cliff edge, there is uh, no legislative uncertainty uh, when Brexit takes place. I mean, it's no secret I, I, don't, I don't support Brexit, but we have managed as a government to differentiate between the legal issues, the issues of, of, of ensuring that there is continuity of law, and the, the political and policy issues. And in this area, we were absolutely clear that there needed to be certainty for businesses and others. And our first preference was to give legislative consent to the UK bill. And it remains our first pref preference, because it's the clearest way to do it. But as we've not been able to reach agreement, both ourselves and the Welsh last year began to talk about anything we could do ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we were not able to grant legislative consent through our formal processes, then we couldn't just leave it at that. We had to have something to come in to follow that. So that was the idea of both continuity bills, uh, and those bills developed over a period of time. Our wish was that we wouldn't bring them. Um, it's an odd thing in legislative terms to have a lot of work going on in a piece of legislation. And, you know, and I've been a minister in other departments, and I'm used to, to that process. But to, to, to all that work going on and saying we don't really want to do this. But eventually, timing back from uh, royal assent and from the passage of the withdrawal bill, we felt we had to bring it. We took it through the Parliament on emergency uh, terms. Uh, the bill contains a clause that allows us to essentially destroy the bill if we, if we have to do so, if there is an agreement with the UK government. But it provides the legislative certainty. It, it provides the repatriation uh, of the powers. It, uh, it, it creates the circumstances in which powers are given to, to ministers just as the UK bill does, but somewhat differently, I have to say. Uh, there is a, there is a, a, a much stronger test uh, in terms of how ministers should act. And, of course, we've taken in, that bill's taken in the, 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 the Charter of Fundamental Rights, and it also has a keeping pace power. So it is our approach to taking these issues forward. Um, and the bill passed 95 votes to 32 in the Scottish Parliament. Uh, it, there is then in Scottish legislation a month or so, 28 days, in which there, nothing happens, and then it can go for royal assent. That is to allow a challenge on, in terms of competence. That challenge has come from a, the Advocate General, and now it will go to the Supreme Court. Um, the Welsh Bill was also challenged, but I understand as part of the agreement they've reached with the UK government, they, that, that reference will be withdrawn. Um, and interestingly, how soon before publishing the bill did you share a draft of the bill with the UK government? Uh, we government? only shared it on, I think, on publication or a day before a publication. Now, that is not normal, no. but we've got ourselves, I'm afraid, to the stage where there is a very substantial lack of trust on both sides. Mm. Um, and I think both of us regret that. But we, we, uh, we did not trust uh, that the, the processes for that bill to go into the system 
and for it to, to, to emerge unscathed, so we did not share it. It was a kind of quid pro, quid pro quo for the British central UK government's um, decision not to show the withdrawal bill to you until it was I hope finalised. It, I hope it wasn't a quid pro quo. I think what well, I think it did reflect, and does reflect, regrettably, is that the, 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 the trust on which this relationship has to be based is at a pretty low ebb. I would have said probably the lowest ebb I've experienced. I was a, I was a member of the JMC committees in 2009 uh, when I was, uh, was in charge of culture and external affairs, and I do think the system is, is, has even less trust in it than it had then. So some work to do to re rebuild trust in these matters. Yes. Yeah. Chair, thank you. Thank you. Marcus Fish. Thank you, thank you Chair. Um, the Welsh Government has agreed... Um, to amendments that the UK government has proposed to the EU withdrawal bill. Um, I was just wondering if you might be able to say a little bit about uh, why the Scottish government takes the view um, that those amendments are not a workable or acceptable compromise. Yes, uh, I'm happy to do so, and, and I do so without criticism of the, of, of the Welsh Government. I mean, I work very closely with Mark Drakeford. That is a decision for them. Uh, we... we spoke last Monday on the phone and, and, and at that stage committed ourselves to continue to work together on a range of issues to do with Brexit. And indeed, I will, I will see him this week in, in London on, on uh, Wednesday prior to a JMC that's due to take place. The political context is different, of course. And I just make that point that the Wales voted to, to, to leave. Scotland voted very substantially to remain. So perhaps the political uh, setting of this is different. But in our view... And, of course, the, the devolution settlement is different, too. They have just moved from a conferred to a reserve powers model. We are you know, firmly founded on a reserve powers model. In our view, the, the, the core issue has not been resolved. Many of the other issues we've discussed in the bill have been resolved. The core issue hasn't been resolved, and that lies in, in Clause 11. Uh, and, essentially, what will happen in these circumstances is that the Scottish Parliament will have its legislative competence very substantially um, um, overruled for a substantial period of time, not just in the 24 areas uh, which are likely to be the subject of frameworks, but in any other area that the UK government chooses. Um, and that, uh, that, that um, tying of the Scottish Parliament will be by legislation, whereby a whereas a commitment from the UK government will be voluntary. So there seem to be, in terms of Mr Hopkins' issue on trust, there seems to be a lack of trust from the UK government in, in the other governments operating honourably and operating according to agreement. Now, we are willing to do one of two things. Either to enter into an agreement with the UK government on the basis of trust, uh, we're happy to sign an agreement to say that we will uh, not knowingly and not, not unreasonably withhold our agreement to any of the uh, frameworks, and indeed we've agreed many of the frameworks, uh, or to revert to the established systems that exist for seeking Scottish Parliament approval. Uh, because we believe that the principles of devolution should be observed. The Brexit may be many things, but it shouldn't be taken as an opportunity to undermine the devolved settlement, uh, and that is what it, we believe it, it would do. So um, have you um, thought, thought about any other uh, ways of offering a compromise other than this concept of uh, consent not, not to be unreasonably withheld? Yes, I think there are, there are two alternatives, and we've, we've made them very clear. And I, you know, I, I've made very, and the First Minister's made clear in the last week, we're very willing to sit down and discuss these. And of course, the House of Lords is considering uh, the, the, the devolution amendments uh, on Wednesday. And you know, there, there's a great deal of thinking going on amongst peers. Um, Lord Hope, for example, I understand, will, will table amendments. There are others, I think, uh, Jim Wallace will, will table amendments. So there's thinking going on there. But the, 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 in our view, there's a very clear choice. One is to have, as I've said, this written agreement, which we're happy to enter into, and that is very similar to the Edinburgh Agreement for the Independence Referendum, or to, to revert to the standard uh, way in which devolution operates, which is well understood and can operate by means of Section 30 orders. What is being proposed here is an additional backstop restraint upon the Scottish Parliament, but without an equivalent backstop restraint upon the UK. And we think that is unreasonable. We also think we'll have deleterious effects. I mean, there are, this covers a whole range of subjects in farming, fishing, 
um, in environment, in, in virtually all the devolved areas. And we believe that this will be not in the interests of the Scottish people. And that's why we take this position. Um, so when, when you think about your concept of how this might be able to work, uh, what, what effect do you think that that would have on the balance that is currently there in the devolution settlements? And I'm thinking in particular, how would you think about solving, I guess, the English question about how we make sure that uh, particular regional, in, in, re, re, regional English interests, for example, are ta taken into proper account in well, the, these matters of having to set common frameworks? Yeah, I, I, the UK has an established constitutional framework, you know, and devolution is the established constitutional settlement, uh, the settled will, uh, you know, Donald Dewar called it. Uh, so we have to operate with that. Now, you know, if, if, the, if, if parts of England wish to have a different settlement, it is, you know, I, I'm not in a position to comment upon them. I, I do speak as somebody who was uh, born in Bromley, which is not a hot, hotbed of Scottish nationalism, but I've long since given up, you know, any, any view that I should uh, have, a, have an opinion on that. From our perspective, there is an established settlement. From our perspective, that is what should be allowed to work, uh, and it should not be undermined and it is being undermined by this proposal. Uh, and that's a position we have taken. It's a position we took with the Continuity Bill that had a very substantial support in the Scottish Parliament. We are now about to take through the legislative consent, a revised legislative consent memorandum through the Scottish Parliament. We start that tomorrow, um, and it, the other parties will, will come to their view on it. But this is a, an issue about ensuring that the powers of the Scottish Parliament, as established, can continue. Um, I think the best way for these relationships to operate is on the basis of trust and it is on the basis of being able to, to work as equal partners. And, of course, that was very much the rhetoric uh, that came out of the independence referendum in 2014, that they, you know, they, they, if the Scottish people did not vote for independence, there would be you know, a partnership of equals. And I think that it is important that if that is what the commitment is, it is on it. Okay, so uh, my, my final question is just with regards to Clause 11, do you think that there is the political will between the two governments to actually come up with a compromise position that works on this, or is it now too late? It's, it's not too late. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm absolutely clear that we are uh, willing to enter into an agreement. Uh, I've made that clear all along. In a sense, I was saying this in a, yesterday in an interview, in a sense, uh, it is perhaps easier now because we are absolutely clear what the one issue is that still remains to be resolved. I mean, we've gone through a, a very lengthy process and very substantial work has been done by all of us, and I've acknowledged that, Mark has acknowledged that, David Liddington has acknowledged that. We've worked very hard on this. Now we have a single issue that requires result, and it's a very clear issue. Um, the House of Lords, as I say, is discussing it on Wednesday. There's still time for that. I think the third reading of the House, bill in the House of Lords is not until the 16th of May. I'm entering into discussion this week. I would like to see a resolution. Thank you. Has anybody else got anything to add to that? Well, thank you for your candor. I mean, I think it's, um, um, I mean, we are hopeful that there will be a resolution and we have not come here to mm. ask divisive and unnecessary questions. Um, so moving on, uh, David Jones. Mr. Russell, um, as you're aware, the devolution settlement as currently framed uh, confers powers upon the Secretary of State for Scotland to uh, make directions requiring the Scottish Government either to take actions or to desist actions in order to ensure compliance with the United Kingdom's international obligations. Um, it, it's likely, of course, that there will be many new international obligations that the UK government will enter into post-Brexit. To what extent are you concerned that this power may have to be exercised? And what is your view as to the likely consequences, politically as opposed to constitutionally, of the exercise of such powers? Well, I would hope that it didn't have to be exercised, because I would hope that the discussions we were able to have about the, the interests of the various parts of these islands could be resolved amicably between us. But the point, if I may say, Mr Jones, is a very good one because it's a, it is one that illustrates that there is already a power that exists within the Scotland Act to tell the Scottish Government to do something. 
Uh, now, I, I, I can't pretend I like that, but I acknowledge it exists, and that is part of the devolution settlement. And until the devolution settlement changes, then that won't change. What is, I believe, in Clause 11 being attempted is another backstop power, to add to that backstop power, so that there, there's another way of ensuring that the Scottish Government doesn't do something. I think that's what we object to. Uh, I'm not, in any sense, trying to overturn the existing constitutional settlement. Uh, you know, I, that may be uh, something I'd like to see happen, but that's not what we're doing in the, in the negotiations. What we're trying to do is to ensure that we deliver something that's workable. Now, I would hope, since negotiation and trust will produce circumstances in which there is a, an agreement, there will be issues, particularly trade issues, where there will be a substantial difference of opinion between Scotland, between Wales, between Northern Ireland, and between the rest of the UK. It is important that those are talked through in a sensible fashion, as happens elsewhere. You know, it does happen, for example, in, in the Canadian system, admittedly it's a federal system, but it does happen in that system that the provinces which have responsibility for certain items uh, are involved in those discussions. If you look at the uh, Canadian treaty with the EU, it was required for those provinces to be involved in those discussions, and it was the EU that required it, so that there was a sensible set of outcomes. And, and that's what we need to aspire to. Uh, but if we, if we believe that inevitably there will be a need to, to implement things in that way, that might be self-fulfilling, and I don't want it to be. Do you see the need for new formal structures to be put in place in order to accommodate this, the, 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 this new relationship that the UK will have with the rest of the world? Um, I can see the need for uh, structures to be put in place. I can see a, a pressing need to revisit the relationships so they are put on a better, and, and I support, a statutory footing. That's why I think the contribution that the Welsh Government made last year in the publication of their paper was very helpful. You know, it, Brexit is, you know, whether you support it or not, and you and I are in opposite sides of that, but you know, respectfully uh, disagreeing with each other, Brexit creates a hugely changed set of circumstances. I think you therefore have to look at the constitutional settlement and say, how do we strengthen that so that everybody believes that they are able to operate it in, a, in the most effective way possible? Now, you know, one of the things that um, Lord Mackay of Clash Fern uh, proposed in the, in the House of Lords was a council of ministers uh, of these islands that would look at the issues in frameworks and would discuss how they operate and that there would be a resolution, dispute resolution procedure arising out of that. That seems to me the type of thing that we need to talk about. There hasn't been a genuine attempt to put the JMC process, for example, on a statutory footing, apart from a, a proposal by the Law Society of Scotland some time ago that was done in, 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 in the, on the tailcoat of another bill, which wasn't very sensible. And so us. it needs to be talked about. And us. And, and, and yourselves, of course. Because, well, you're, you go without saying your, your wisdom on these matters, I have to say. But it needed to be done, and probably still needs to be done. And beyond that, beyond a council of ministers, what about institutional relations between the legislatures? Well, I think that that's important too, but we, we won't get there if a lot of the, uh, if the proposals presently being discussed uh, essentially create the circumstances as the current amendments that the UK government is bringing in the House of Lords this week get, that even if the Scottish Parliament votes against something, it is taken to be consent. I think that's going in the wrong direction. If you're going to have a, a system that works, then it should respect the decisions of the legislatures, um, but should, should operate in a way that it is possible to, to, to achieve consent by negotiation and discussion. That's the best way to do it. Okay. Thank you. You said. Um, some 10 years or so ago, I was a member of the predecessor committee of this, and we visited Scotland and uh, in a meeting which was put to us by an SNP MSP that Scotland is culturally social democratic, in much more so than England, um, and that uh, you know, using government actively to benefit society is, is seen to be a good thing. Um, for example, I mean, state aids, public procurement, all of these things will become free to well, you know, to indulge in by 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 um, after 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 Brexit, and would this, is this not an attractive prospect to Scottish um, government? 
I, I, it is a very beguiling uh, argument that you're putting, Mr. Hopkins. I, I don't agree with it for, for two reasons. One is uh, because I think that the operation of public procurement, uh, for example, is already reflects in Scotland the social democratic values. It is possible to do so with the public procurement process that we have. We have a different public procurement process than the process uh, south of the border. I think that the, the possibility is, if this is seen as a... Uh, reserved area, which is of course the argument the UK government is putting at the moment, that will become very much a, a, a UK-style public procurement process, which would have the opposite effect of the one that we wanted. State aids is an interesting one, because people, people um, chafe about state aids very substantially. But, you know, I, I am a believer, and it's not a heretical view, I am a believer in the importance of the single market. And the state aids process is a very important process in underpinning the single market. And the benefits of the single market are espoused also very strongly, of course, by, by, by conservatives and others over the years. The, the benefits of the single market are extremely powerful. And therefore, a state aids process is a benefit to that. Now, sometimes it, it is annoying, but most of the time it operates in a way that allows that level playing field. The parallel I would give you, and I speak as a former environment minister, is many of the environmental directives. There are times if you're an environment minister, you do chafe against the environmental directives because you want to do things in a different way. But the overall benefit of those environmental directives and the environmental policy that has been pursued has been enormously beneficial. So I, I am not tempted. In fact, I think the, 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 the likelihood of a severe deterioration in those uh, is, is probably what I'm looking at. Well, I won't prolong this, but uh, the, there have been occasions when the European Union, its institutions, have um, been very concerned and very sensitive about state aids and have challenged the use of state aids. Um, they believe in a free competitive market, but they don't believe that specific governments would help their own industries. Well, and, and, and there is a good argument for so doing. There are, of course, exceptions in state aids, and, and the way in which you operate the state aid system is one in, which is not absolutely inflexible. I am certainly not saying the EU is a perfect institution, but I am saying that to demonise state aids in the way that's been demonised is, in my view, inaccurate, and to uh, allow that to be an issue which becomes solely a UK issue will run the risk, in my view, of it becoming considerably worse for Scotland rather than better. Thank you. I'm very interested in this area because, of course, the EU has tended to create very tight straitjackets around things like public procurement policy and state aids policy, uh, which are basically international rules which the European Union is interpreting. So to what extent are you saying that um, some of the flexibility to interpret the, inter the meanings of these international obligations should in fact be should be held locally rather than, well, uh, than, than laid down by the United Kingdom government? Public procurement is, is an area uh, where the Scottish Parliament's uh, 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 competences intersect with EU competences. So there is an element of both within the operation of public procurement within Scotland. So there is a specific Scottish public procurement um, organisation. It operates, of course, by EU rules, but it also tries to operate to reflect local circumstances. And that is the principle of subsidiarity, you know, which is a principle which underpins the EU as well as elsewhere. But then, of course, you can look at the WTO uh, and its work in public procurement and say, you know, even if you were completely out with the, the EU, even if you were you know, determined to have nothing to do even with any voluntary agreement with the EU, you would find yourself in pretty much a morass in Geneva uh, as soon as you'd done so. So, uh, you know, I think, uh, I think the, e the, the shared competences are something that works for Scotland. Now, of course, they're not perfect. And, of course, there will always be an element of chafing on, on both sides. But I think that's worked pretty well. And I, with respect, I don't think it would work any better. Uh, in fact, I think it worked considerably worse if those powers were reserved to the UK. And uh, the Scottish Parliament was forbidden from uh, legislating within them for a period of up to seven years, which is what could happen. Um, Marcus Fish? Uh, yes, thanks, Chair. Uh, one of the things we discussed in one of the sessions earlier was the idea of having pra practical work streams through which we can uh, together exercise this idea of shared um, elucidation of our goals and, and uh, not, not necessarily having them have to be on a statutory foot footing. And I'm on the International Trade Committee of the House of Commons. And so, so we're undertaking an inquiry as to what the best methods are, look, looking at best practice around the world, of essentially build, build, building consensus 
within the nation, for the, the wider nation, for us to uh, be able to have an idea about what our goals, for example, in making new international obligations should, should be. And I just wondered if you had any thoughts as to the way that Sc Scotland might like to be involved in, in that sort of thing. Well, there is discussion, of course, going on about what those structures might look like. And I'm very heartened to, to, to know that the, the, the committee is looking at those things because I think it will be important to recognise that where there are frameworks operating and, and, you know, a framework of some sort that operates in terms of trade, uh, fully knowledgeable of the fact that, you know, international obligations can be imposed, as, as, as Mr Jones has said, um, would be very helpful. Th those frameworks w will apply in different ways and be of different types. You know, you could look at a very deterministic framework for example, in animal health, where it is quite clear you would wish to have a framework that recognised the same imperatives and operated in the same way in animal health. My own view is it should also have a keeping pace power with the EU, given the difficulties of passing uh, primary legislation this all the time, but that's another issue. That framework will be very different from the type of framework that you're talking about, where there needs to be a, a, a fairly wide-ranging uh, discussion and formula by which international trade arrangements can be come to there will be some parts of that which will require to be delivered in Scotland. And therefore, there has to be an agreement that that can happen. That needs consultation and you know, regular um, working together and a structure that actually is effective and which we all trust. Uh, and those are the elements that need to be put into it. Now, we are presently quite a long way away from that, but it's quite right that we should look at how it should, and we should look at it elsewhere, as it does work, as I just indicated, in Canada. Um, it does work uh, in other places. We need to work out how it, does, how it can work for us. Are you finished? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, moving on, um, Mr. Thompson, can I just... We discussed briefly the relationships between officials, um, uh, UK officials and Scottish officials. But, um, can I press you a bit more on that? Because at a meeting of perm sex, the Scottish Permanent Secretary, Leslie Evans, gave what she has described as, and I quote, a pretty frank presentation on behalf of the three devolved administrations about our experience of working with the UK government on EU exit and the challenges and opportunities ahead. Could you, without wanting to cause you or anybody else embarrassment, um, set out what the difficulties actually are and what needs to be done about them? Oh, it's an interesting question. Uh, I think uh, you'll have gathered from what the Minister has said that uh, there are substantial areas of disagreement between the governments and part of the purpose of the work that officials do is to ensure that we can be frank about those, um, both as to the substance, which we've been talking about, but also as to the process. Um, and the, the process is challenging for, um, for all of us, um, in part because of the asymmetry that one of your previous um, witnesses referred to. So the UK government is a much larger organisation or set of organisations, um, and it has to deal with a larger range of, of issues on any one day. So um, expecting it to be, all, everybody in it to be fully conver conversant with all of the detail of the devolution settlement or the issues that arise between governments would be unrealistic. But it is important for the system as a whole to have the capacity and the understanding within it to be able to focus on um, these issues where they do arise and make sure that we, we don't start from the wrong place because that makes it harder to get to the right so place. So what, what you're saying is that knowledge and understanding of what devolution actually is and how it operates is actually hampering the discussions because you have to start meetings by explaining some very basic things. That can be the experience. There are quite a lot of things that we do to uh, build that understanding and capacity. Um, the Cabinet Office runs a programme called Devolution and You, which is designed to, to spread that awareness around. Uh, we sit on staff to each other. Um, and on Friday, in fact, in Edinburgh, the, the uh, policy profession um, had a four nations conference with people from the UK government, the Scottish government, the Welsh government, and the Northern Irish executive, um, sharing um, our experiences and um, approaches to a range of policy challenges not limited to Brexit. Um, uh, um, Mr. Yeah, the, the issue of devolution awareness in Whitehall has, has long been a problem. 
Um, and at the start of the coalition government, a system of devolution champions was put in place across Whitehall. Do you know if that uh, system still prevails there? Yes, it does. And in fact, uh, my counterparts in Whitehall have been um, recognising the need to strengthen that, given the uh, significant additional weight that Brexit puts onto the intergovernmental relationship, both formally and informally. So notwithstanding the presence of devolution champions across Whitehall, there is still, uh, in your opinion, a great deal of uh, ignorance of devolution amongst officials in, in Whitehall. Uh, well, ignorance was your word rather than mine. But, no, well, uh, well I, what, what, what would your word be? Uh, I, I think that it is hard for a, a large system such as, as the uh, Whitehall system uh, to, um, to be fully uh, conversant with all of the detail of both the devolution settlement and the issues that are live within it. But I think what, what, uh, what you need to have in order to make all of this work is uh, a good general awareness and then the ability to focus quickly on the issues that need to be resolved. And the experience that uh, Mr Russell's been describing is one of um, having made significant progress on those issues but not yet having got to um, a solution on that one. And that is the prime challenge at the moment in that relationship. Okay. I, mean, I, would submit, I, mean, I was uh, parliamentary private secretary to Michael Forsyth when he was Secretary of State for Scotland. And I would say this problem predates devolution. Um, uh, it's um, very embedded in the, in the Whitehall culture. Ah, oh, what about Scotland? What about Northern Ireland? Mm. Um, what more can be done to improve the communication? Um, or, or indeed the, uh, not, uh, the, 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 the degree of fam familiarity with which officials who are advising English ministers and UK ministers um, on policy um, their, their familiarity with the devolution principles and settlement? Uh, well, to give you a, quite a brief answer, I think that there's a combination of formal structures and informal relationships and networks. And we do our best to, um, to ensure that the second of those happens through the, the civil service contacts. Um, the formal side of it takes us back into the, how the JMC works and whether we could strengthen that. But if, um, I mean, ultimately, if... Uh, I mean, you mentioned this uh, policy profession Four Nations Conference. Um, what came out of that that is going to make it better? Um, out of that and also out of exchange visits and so on, um, I think what, what, what I took from that event last Friday was that um, setting aside Brexit, but even embracing the, the set of issues that Brexit throws up, um, there is a lot of commonality in the kinds of challenges that, that, that we as policy officials face in the four administrations. They tend to be um, complex and systemic uh, and not uh, susceptible to qu quick wins or easy answers. And we, um, it, back at the time that devolution happened, there was a phrase that was used a lot of that this would create in some sense a policy laboratory in the United Kingdom where it would be possible, for example, for the different administrations to take different approaches to, f for example, uh, smoking cessation. Scotland um, introduced a, a ban on smoking in public places uh, before other parts of the UK. So that, that, in, in many places the, that system works and you see approaches being taken that are different between the different administrations and the administrations learning from each other, both um, ministers and officials. Uh, but it doesn't always get us to agreement on uh, the most intense discussions. So to what extent do you feel there is a sense of obligation on permanent secretaries to ensure that they include advice about devolution implications on any policy they're advising a UK or English minister to adopt? Uh, I would be surprised if that wasn't the case, especially in the, the departments in Whitehall that have the, the most salient um, devolution issues. So, so where does it fall down? Where does the lack of attention come from? Um, th there are two things that can get in the way of, of making progress and reaching agreement. One is um, lack of knowledge and familiarity with the issues, and that can usually be resolved if you can get the, the attention of people focused onto it. The second is that simply um, these administrations are led by different politicians and they have different views. And if, if the policies are different, then you can expect a disagreement. And then, yes. then you have to find ways of resolving those through a political process. Yes. Well, we know there's plenty of that. Um, and has, to what extent has the frequency and quality of intergovernmental meetings actually improved the flow of information uh, to the Scottish Civil Service so that the Scottish government's more capable of preparing for, um, for Brexit? 
I think the, the pattern and the flow of information very much reflects that, driven by the, the ministerial engagement that Mr. Russell's mentioned. So um, if there's going to be a JMC EN or a plenary, then in the run-up to that, there will be a lot of, of communication and activity. But it would be wrong to, to give the impression that um, this is somehow occasional or a set piece. I mean, they, um, there are emails and phone calls between officials in the different administrations. But, but all the regularity the time. of JMCs actually intensifies the official exchange of it, it focuses attention in the way that I described it. As one would expect. Yeah. Anything to add? Well, I, I think the, the regularity of JMCs does that, but probably it fades away quite quickly. Uh, there needs to be a more sustained approach. Uh, Rupa Huck. Um, yeah. The Welsh Government's put forward proposals for the reform of intergovernmental relations, um, and it's popped up in every uh, panel we've spoken to today and also in Cardiff when we were there. <coughs> Um, do the current set of arrangements require reform? I mean, you just said the GMCs are unreliable and stuff. What would you do? How would you reform it? I think everybody agrees on the need for reform. Um, you know, this committee has agreed on that. Uh, every parliamentary committee looked at it. Huge amount of academic study on this. Um, and there have been very s small uh, reforms that have helped the process a little. Um, I have to say that... Uh, uh, Damien Green uh, slimmed down the JMC, quite substantial JMC, EN, from what it had uh, become. There's a tendency for UK ministers to attend, uh, and more and more UK ministers to attend. Uh, it actually, I think, works best if it's a comparatively small ministerial meeting, uh, ideally one from each of the devolved administration. Northern Ireland always has two, of course, uh, and then the equivalent number of UK ministers. It doesn't help if it spreads beyond that. I once went to a JMC Europe meeting in 2009, which I believe there were 21 UK ministers, myself and, and Rodri Morgan. It didn't produce you know, much of a dialogue, uh, really, in terms of what took place. So the small reforms have worked. I think there now needs to be, and I commend the Welsh paper, I think there's lots of good things in it, now needs to be some determination to produce a reform JMC system that can uh, stand you know, the processes of Brexit and go beyond it. That will require the UK government to want that to happen, I think that there is an indication that the Welsh government and the Scottish government are very keen to have reform. Um, I haven't seen any equivalent desire from the UK government to have that reform. And, of course, there is a difficulty with Northern Ireland. Um, the previous... Uh, there was a revised memorandum of understanding which was to be implemented, which was never able to be implemented because they couldn't get agreement in Northern Ireland. So there is that issue to resolve. Um, but it does need to be resolved. So just an aside, historically, do you know why it was, why it is that uh, we as Westminster parliamentarians were not allowed to have this meeting in the Scottish Parliament? I or don't know. history or something? I don't know, but um, oh, okay. I'm sure we can find somebody who does know. Yeah, no, it just seems a bit anomalous. Uh, yeah. We were able to go to uh, the... Uh, the separation assembly. between government and parliament is such that I would not have the answer to that. OK, I mean, it's not your fault. We do actually meet in the Cardiff. Right. Yeah, well, we've, uh, I'm unaware of that, not. but uh, no doubt an answer. But I mean, I think there's... It. To be fair, I think there's some reciprocal arrangements we could offer ah, to right. Scottish Parliament. You're welcome anytime. <laughs> um, which we, we are working on. But anyway, carry on. Um, how would you see dispute resolution when the two arms, three arms, whatever, how would that, would it be ACAS, relate? I mean, how would you? That has always been the most difficult element in the JMC because essentially, presently, dispute resolution means that the UK government get to decide. You know, so it, it's not uh, even-handed. The JMC equally doesn't meet outside London. I think it's met twice outside London, both times in Cardiff. Uh, the agenda is, is usually uh, essentially agreed by the UK government. There needs to be uh, a much more equitable process. Maybe an independent secretariat would, would help. Um, dispute resolution, it is very difficult to see because the concept of Westminster parliamentary sovereignty gets in the way of dispute resolution and equitable dispute resolution. Uh, I think that requires a lot of discussion um, because without some discussion of that, then we won't get a dispute resolution that's satisfactory to the devolved administrations. Um, presently, that undermines the whole process because at the end of the day, you know, you, know, you can't really uh, get uh, uh, anything out of it if you come to a disagreement. Right. And just uh, finally, should there be, I'm sure there should be, interparliamentary scrutiny of intergovernmental relations? How should that take, how should that be constituted? Uh, and there is an element of that in the Scottish Parliament. Um, I report from each JMC, I would write to the relevant committee, telling them it's taken place and what has been discussed, uh, and I'm often questioned upon it. 
and indeed on, in terms of Brexit, I have taken to reporting to the Chamber from uh, time to time on key developments and would continue to do so. And that is, I, I think that does require to take place. It would be interesting, I mean, I know there are informal meetings now between the, some of the parliamentary committees, you yourselves, I think, have, have taken part in those. I think that would be interesting to see how those could develop. Mm. I think this one's mine as well. Uh, well, can I just oh. in intervene on just one thing? Uh, we were talking a, a minute ago about the Welsh Government proposals for reform of intergovernmental relations. Can I be clear? Do you actually support those? Uh, I support them in the sense I think there's lots of good ideas in them. They've never come to the stage where we've sat down and said, we'll take this one and not that one. Um, but I support the process that they, they, they've started off and engaged in. Uh, there are elements in them, the, the idea of a council of ministers, I think is absolutely right. Um, when you come to issues like qualified majority voting, I'm not against that, but I'd want to spend some time considering it. Uh, you know, and there are issues for the Westminster Parliament more than for ourselves. But I think they have started something very well. Unfortunately, it hasn't yet been taken up by the UK government as part of the process of change. Thank you. Rupa Huck. Yeah, this committee ran on online public forum to canvas public opinion. I think it was 1,300 responses or something like that in advance of this session. And a staggering, I think the figures have been slightly manipulated to take out spoiled responses, but 98% of all respondents indicated that the UK and Scottish governments and parliaments do not successfully work t well together. And only 0.1%, tiny fraction, indicated that it's all working harmoniously. So what can be done to develop and rebuild, maybe it was never there, build in the first place, mutual trust and respect between the Westminster and Scottish legislatures? I think you would have to see that as a, a part of a wider issue. I mean, there's a survey today that, that is published in terms of confidence in the UK political system. The lowest confidence in the UK political system is in Scotland. It's at 16%. At London, I think it's 41%. So there's a very substantially low uh, confidence in the UK political system. Uh, in surveys, uh, it, it, the Scottish government gets a much higher rating all the time in terms of what it should do and trust in it in the UK government. So there's, a, there's an issue in there that, that, that you know, is, is part of the processes of our times. Devolution has been part of that process. Um, I think it is possible to envisage a better set of arrangements through, through formal arrangements between the governments through a JMC process. That has never worked. And perhaps we are all at fault for allowing that to continue for 20 years, knowing that it is deeply flawed and does, it is not satisfactory for anybody. I mean, I have, I have never heard from any colleague in Scotland or in Wales uh, satisfaction with that system. So it is a matter of reform of that system. Now, maybe Brexit is the, the impetus that that needs for a radical reform of that system. So we, but it, there also needs to be an understanding that for the devolved administrations, they see that as being a system in which four countries sit down and come to an agreement together. Uh, they don't just go to London and after a meeting, then it's a foregone conclusion. You know, the, the, I'm very delighted to see you here, uh, but you yourselves know, and you know, you're seasoned, I know that the chair is a seasoned traveller to and from Scotland. For me to go to a JMCEN in London is considerably more difficult, for example, in the Welsh to go to a JMCEN in London, and much, much more difficult than, than the UK minister going to a JMCEN in London. Uh, that needs to be factored into these processes uh, as well. So we have some issues to resolve, and it would give some confidence, perhaps, if we were seen to be attempting to resolve them. If I may, Chairman. Um, Mr. Russell, do, do you think that part of the problem is that the current devolution settlement is pretty inflexible? That there are hard edges of, of devolution which really could do with being softened and delighted? Um, I'll give you an example. I wanted to come in on, uh, on the earlier session and ask a question about Mr. Rennie, who essentially said that the health service, for example, in Scotland didn't have uh, any interest for, for England, uh, which of course is not the case in Wales, as you probably know, where uh, English patients rely heavily uh, upon medical services provided in Wales, uh, yet of course they have no political representation in the Welsh Assembly. Um, and do you think that maybe that is an aspect of the matter that needs revisiting and uh, trying to find ways of accommodating people who are at the moment being disadvantaged by these hard edges in the devolution settlement? 
I can't think of any such hard edges in the Scottish settlement. I mean, I think that that's probably because you've got such a large, thinly populated border area between. There are some Scotland pragmatic solutions applied in in you know, where where there are issues that could arise. For example, in, you know, and, and you may many of you may know this, but the the, the administration of the Solway and the Border Esk are done in different ways as, as rivers. The Solway is administered by Scotland, the Border Esk is administered by England. Uh, and that is a practical solution, rather an elegant practical solution, to the administration of, of two rivers that might create difficulties in terms of, of fisheries of one sort or another. So I think there's been pragmatic solutions. And at the start, I mean, I'm, I'm fortunately old enough to have been in at the beginning of, of devolution. And at the start of devolution, there was a lot of work done on cross-border bodies so we would understand how things worked. I think, I, I actually uh, think the opposite it might be true. I think we need to be clear exactly what, and codify exactly what the relationships are. And because we have a reserve powers model that is clear, uh, we should stick to that. But perhaps we, what we now need to do is to make sure that we are clear and codify the way in which we work together. That may be the, 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 the substantial issue, which you of course are addressing here, because we have never had that in a clear fashion. So possibly, for example, Scottish participation sometimes in Westminster committees and vice versa. Well, I, that would be an idea that is worthy of discussion. And equally, when Scottish Parliament committees ask Westminster ministers to appear in front of them to discuss issues, that should be seen as something worth doing. You know, um, I know that, that, that David Davis is incredibly busy, but I think he's been asked five or six times and hasn't been as yet. So that does create a circumstance in which people say, well, maybe he doesn't want to come. I have to say that I appear in front of Scottish Parliament committees and Westminster committees, um, and um, I think it's important that we all do that. I, I can only say, as a former member of the Welsh Affairs Select Committee, I, I understand your pain. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Rupert. Oh, uh, Kelvin. Just briefly, um, Mr. Russell, you touched, I heard the word fishing in, in your recent oration. Um, I wonder if Mr. Thompson could tell us whether there have been any deep dive discussions on the future of the fishing industry. I have to say that there have been some excellent presentations by the fishing industry at Westminster in which Scottish fishermen have taken a leading role, I have to say. Um, and fishing after the CFP strikes me, and from these presentations, that we could solve all the problems thrown up with the CFP and have a much better fishing industry for everyone concerned. Um, do you have to any discussions, Mr. Thompson? Am I allowed to respond as well? Uh, well I'll, I'll leave I'll the question of the fishing policy to Mr. Russell. Yes. Um, the, uh, on the question of um, areas in which we need to look, uh, need to understand the issues thrown up by Brexit, then fisheries is obviously a key one of those, as is uh, agriculture and the rural environment generally. And indeed, um, when we are thinking about the areas in Whitehall where we need to ensure that the relationships are um, best and um, we work together well, whether or not there are disagreements, then our counterparts in DEFRA are, are near the top of that list. So yes, there's a lot of work going on on agriculture and fisheries. And one should be careful about seeing the Scottish fishing industry as a monolithic industry, of course. I, you know, I represent uh, the constituents of Argyll and Butte, which are the very substantial fishery, and the Clyde Fishermen's Association uh, are no longer members of the SFF, but the Scottish Fishermen's Federation, of course, and have a different view of, of how things should proceed, uh, particularly as their main market would be exposing, exporting shellfish to the continent, uh, and the prospect of being able to do that without let or hindrance, if I may quote that, is uh, not at all good at the present moment. You. Right. Um, the deep... I think we've done that one. I think um, uh, the devolved competences and powers of the Scottish Parliament have developed over the um, period since the Scotland Act in 1998. Um, assuming, um, well, until such time as you achieve your desired goal, which is Scottish independence, do you have a vision of how devolution should operate as part of the United Kingdom? Well, I think it is a, if I may go back and quote Donald Dewar at the very outset, it is a process and not an event. Uh, devolution has been changing and maturing and we learn more about it. Uh, I think it was David Cameron who observed that the UK government seemed to have devolved and forgot and that might be one of the issues, for example, as Ken has uh, talked about in terms of knowledge of devolution. But I do think the time is right to 
to take the relationships and to make sure that they are they operate in a well understood and well ordered way, and the way in which they presently operate is is not well understood and often is not well ordered. So I think that is a matter for attention. But you're right to say, Chair, that my own view is that there needs to be a continued growth in the powers of the Parliament, and then we will be able to uh, operate as good neighbours uh, rather than as uh, mm. as the old adage has it sir, as, as a surly lodger. But until such time as Scotland votes conclusively to leave the United Kingdom, um, if devolution is to continue to be a process, it has to be a two-way process. Um, and these hard edges, which my colleague Mr Jones was talking about, perhaps need to be blurred a bit more. <clears throat> I mean, I'm thinking of um, uh, uh, other areas where um, not so much cross-border issues, but um, um, the, the development of these frameworks are going to be very blurred areas of, of shared responsibility. Um, uh, what, what, I mean, apart from, is there anything else you would, would like to add? That would... Well, we, we, we've said from the very beginning of this process, we are more than willing to enter into those frameworks. We are keen to see those frameworks established. They have to be established on the basis of, of, of trust uh, and mutual respect and operated in that way. And provided they can operate in that way, then I think you will find we will be effective partners in operating. And what do you think are the immediate next steps to pursue that? We have to resolve the issue of Clause 11 of the Bill on the basis of, of trusting each other, and then we can get on and set those frameworks up. The deep dive process has been successful. Uh, by and large, we've, we've learned a great deal. There's a great deal of information in the system now. Those, those frameworks can operate. Uh, they're not all going to be identical. But in order to do so, we've got to have uh, the ability to operate um, as partners. Well, uh, Mr. Thompson. Could I just add one point to the, this question of, of the blurringness or bl blurring in the responsibilities? Um, I think I would take the opposite view, uh, which is that it's really important to be clear about which government is responsible for and accountable to parliaments for what. And once you're clear about that, then you need to emphasise the importance of working together. And this does work well in many areas, for example, in um, cooperation on um, terrorist incidents or terrorist threats, where uh, you have a, a separate independent prosecutorial system and police service in Scotland um, needing to work very closely with its counterparts in the rest of the United Kingdom. And that does work pretty well, I think. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's possible to have sharp edges on accountability and responsibility and work together well. Um, I think in an organisational terms, you would call it clarity about roles, responsibility and tasks, even if there is shared responsibility and shared accountability. Exactly. Um, uh, I think that's the way I would phrase it. Sorry, would you, would you agree with that? Yeah. Um, uh, can I just add that we're very pleased to have had new evidence, which we've uh, agreed to publish today from the presiding officer of the Scottish Parliament, Ken McIntosh. Um, and... Uh, he has expressed very strong support for uh, interparliamentary relations and uh, uh, cross-parliamentary scrutiny of intergovernmental relationships. And we, we agree that that's a very important part of the, the building of trust. Uh, if there's anything else you want to add, we can let you go pretty well on time, Minister. Thank you. And thank you. And thank you for coming to Edinburgh. I'm sorry you're... Original visit was snowed off, but I'm glad you hear that. Well, I'm very sorry it was, but it seems that each time uh, my committee comes to Edinburgh, the government suffers a resignation. Um, uh, so next time we come, uh, we hope to be less disruptive. As long as it's not the government of which I'm a member. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Order Thank you. Order. Thank you.